Basically, as far as technology is concerned, for every calendar year that transpires, military technology increases about 34.5 years. This is why it is easy to understand that back in 1943 they were able to create, through the use of vacuum tube technology, a ship that could literally disappear from one place and appear in another place. My father, Otto Oscar Schneider, fought on both sides of the war. He was originally a U-boat captain, and was captured and repatriated in the United States. He was involved with different kinds of concerns, such as the A-bomb, the H-bomb and the Philadelphia Experiment. He invented a high-speed camera that took pictures of the first atomic hydrogen or H-bomb, Branton Tess at Bikini Island on July 12, 1946. I have original photographs of that test, and the photos also show UFOs fleeing the bomb site at a high rate of speed. Bikini Island at the time was infested with them, especially under the water, and the natives had problems with their animals being mutilated. At the time, General MacArthur felt that the next war would be with aliens from other worlds. Anyway, my father laid the groundwork with theoreticians about the Philadelphia experiment, as well as other experiments. What does that have to do with me? Nothing, other than the fact that he was my father. I don't agree with what he did on the other side, but I think he had a lot of guts in coming here. He was hated in Germany. There was a $1 million reward, payable in gold, to anyone who killed him. Obviously, they didn't succeed. Anyway, back to our topic, deep underground bases. Back in 1954, under the Eisenhower administration, the federal government decided to circumvent the Constitution of the United States and form a treaty with alien entities. It was called the 1954 Grunner Treaty Eisenhower Administration established contact landings at Holloman AFB, New Mexico, and Morak Edwards AFB, California in 1954. This was a year after the Greys had established geosynchronous orbits around our planet within two planetoids that had been engineered to serve as operational bases for later abduction, implantation, cattle mutilation, base construction, and infiltration operations. Branton which basically made the agreement that the aliens involved could take a few cows and test their implanting techniques on a few human beings, but that they had to give details about the people involved. Slowly, the aliens altered the bargain until they decided they wouldn't abide by it at all. Back in 1979, this was the reality, and the firefight at Dulce occurred quite by accident. I was involved in building an addition to the deep underground military base at Dulce, which is probably the deepest base. It goes down seven levels and over 2.5 miles deep. At that particular time, we had drilled four distinct holes in the desert, and we were going to link them together and blow out large sections at a time. My job was to go down the holes and check the rock samples, and recommend the explosive to deal with a particular rock. As I was headed down there, we found ourselves amidst a large cavern that was full of outer space or inner space. Branton, aliens, otherwise known as large greys. I shot two of them. At the time, there were 30 people down there. About 40 more came down after this started, and all of them got killed. We had surprised a whole underground base of existing aliens. Later, we found out that they had been living in our planet for a long time. This could explain a lot of what is behind the theory of ancient astronauts. Note, this report seems to reveal a limited perspective on the overall Dulce Wars based on the experience of one man. It appears however from a number of sources as if there was much more involved in the overall scenario than what Phil Schneider describes. For instance from Phil's description it would appear as if his team broke into the base accidentally. It could have been that in response to the captured scientists mentioned by Thomas Edwin Costello and others, special military forces and agents intentionally attempted to break into the underground alien bases through a back door, so to speak, yet Schneider may have not been aware of this part. Other reports would suggest that the conflict was more complex than this, involving more than one firefight. According to Thomas Costello, John Lear, Bill Cooper, and other sources, the Dulce Wars involved at least a hundred highly trained special forces, including Delta Force Black Barrets, Air Force Blue Barrets, Division 5 FBI, CIA, and Secret Service. Because of the cover-up, Special Forces units with the necessary security clearances for this type of operation were rare. Needless to say, this war did not have the full backing of Congress and the American people, and this no doubt contributed to the loss of the 66 Special Force personnel who died in the conflict. Following the confrontation, 
Though the United States government withdrew from all negotiations with the Greys and a rift began to develop within the intelligence community. It appears as if this split can be traced back to Kirtland Afghan, New Mexico, which became divided over what to do about the Dulce situation and the aliens in general. Colonel Edwards and the wing commander wanted to support Paul Benuitz in a full-scale investigation of Dulce and they petitioned the White House, which at first agreed and told them to go ahead with the project. That is until forces elsewhere in the intelligence community begin to bring pressure against the White House and Kirtland F to drop the whole thing. Kirtland F Colonel Richard Doty seems to have been torn between two intelligence agendas, explaining his seemingly schizophrenic reversals in policy regarding Dulce and related matters. Some segments of the United States intelligence wanted to declare war on the Greys and develops D weapons that could be used against them in space and underground, whereas others, apparently motivated by more sinister motives, desire to continue negotiations. Two years following the Dulce Wars, Aquarius and Magi re-established negotiations with the Greys at Dulce for the purpose it would seem of gaining continued access to mind control technology for their New World Order agenda. Brandon, anyway. I got shot in the chest with one of their weapons, which was a box on their body, that blew a hole in me and gave me a nasty dose of cobalt radiation. I have had cancer because of that. I didn't get really interested in UFO technology until I started work at Area 51, north of Las Vegas. After about two years recuperating after the 1979 incident, I went back to work for Morrison and Knudsen, for example and G and other companies. At Area 51, they were testing all kinds of peculiar spacecraft. How many people here are familiar with Bob Lazar's story? He was a physicist working at Area 51 trying to decipher the propulsion factor in some of these craft. Now, I am very worried about the activity of the federal government. They have lied to the public, stonewalled senators, and have refused to tell the truth in regard to alien matters. I can go on and on. I can tell you that I am rather disgruntled. Recently, I knew someone who lived near where I live in Portland, Oregon. He worked at Gunderson Steel Fabrication, where they make railroad cars. Now, I knew this fellow for the better part of 30 years, and he was kind of a quiet type. He came in to see me one day, excited, and he told me they are building prisoner cars. He was nervous. Gunderson, he said, had a contract with the federal government to build 107,200 full-length railroad cars, each with 143 pairs of shackles. There are 11 subcontractors in this giant project. Supposedly, Gunderson got over $2 billion for the contract. Bethlehem Steel and other steel outfits are involved. He showed me one of the cars in the rail yards in North Portland. He was right. If you multiply 107,200 times 143 times 11, you come up with about 15 million. This is probably the number of people who disagree with the federal government. No more can you vote any of these people out of office. Our present structure of government is technocracy, not democracy, and it is a form of feudalism. Note, I would venture to say that it is more like a techno-monarchy, since several of the United States presidents since Truman have been placed in office with Rockefeller financial media backing, suggesting that these same presidents were inclined to favor certain Rockefeller corporate agendas over the interests of the American people. The techno-monarchy would constitute those parts of the military-industrial complex, or MIC, that are largely influenced by Rockefeller and European black nobility interests. When the American Union was young, the Continental Congress was fearful that the roots of monarchy might rise within the new republic. There were critics who suggested that we should not even have a chief executive or a president for this very reason, however by majority vote they installed George Washington as the first the United States president with the hopes that all those who came after him would follow his example of selfless devotion and patriotism. Unfortunately the Continental Congress was wrong, and had overestimated the integrity of those the United States presidents who would come later. Branton. It, our present form of government, has nothing to do with the Republic of the United States. These people are godless, and have legislated out prayer in public schools. You can get fined up to $100,000 and two years in prison for praying in school. I believe we can do better. I also believe that the federal government is running the gambit of enslaving the people of the United States. I am not a very good speaker, but I'll keep shooting my mouth off until somebody puts a bullet in me, because it's worth it to talk to a group like this about these atrocities. There are other problems. I have some interesting 1993 figures. There are 29 prototype stealth aircraft presently. 
The budget from the, the United States Congress five-year plan for these is $245.6 million. You couldn't buy the spare parts for these black programs for that amount. So, we've been lied to. The black budget is roughly $1.3 trillion every two years. A trillion is a thousand billion. A trillion dollars weighs 11 tons. Though the United States Congress never sees the books involved with this clandestine pot of gold. Contractors of these programs, for example Ann G. Westinghouse, McDonnell Douglas, Morrison Knudsen, Wackenhut Security Systems, Boeing Aerospace, Lorimar Aerospace, Aras Spatial in France, Mitsubishi Industries, Ryder Trucks, Bechtel, Osvrisk IG Farben Asterisk, plus a host of hundreds more. Is this what we are supposed to be living up to as freedom-loving people? I don't believe so. Still, 68% of the military budget is directly or indirectly affected by the black budget. Star Wars relies heavily upon stealth weaponry. By the way, none of the stealth program would have been available if we had not taken apart crashed alien disks. None of it. Some of you might ask what the space shuttle is shuttling. Large ingots of special metals that are milled in space and cannot be produced on the surface of the Earth. They need the near vacuum of outer space to produce them. We are not even being told anything close to the truth. I believe our government officials have sold us down the drain, lock, stock and barrel. Up until several weeks ago, I was employed by the, the United States government with a Rhyolite 38 clearance factor, one of the highest in the world. I believe the Star Wars program is there solely to act as a buffer to prevent alien attack. It has nothing to do with the Cold War, which was only a toy to garner money from all the people. For what? The whole lie was planned and executed for the last 75 years. Here's another piece of information for you folks. The Drug Enforcement Administration and the Atfrilia on Stealth Tactical Weapon refer as much as 40% of their operations budget. This in 1993 and the figures have gone up considerably since. The United Nations used American stealth aircraft for over 28% of its collective worldwide operations from 1990 to 1992, according to the Center for Strategic Studies and UN Report 3092. I don't perceive at this time that we have too much more than six months of life left in this country, at the present rate. We are the laughing stock of the world, because we are being hoodwinked by so many evil people that are running this country. I think we can do better. I think the people over 45 are seriously worried about their future. I'm going to run some scary scenarios by you. The contract with America. It contains the same terminology that Adolf Hitler used to subvert Germany in 1931. I believe we can do better. The contract with America or is it the contract on America? Branton is a last ditch effort by our federal government to tear away the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The black helicopters. There are over 64,000 black helicopters in the United States. For every hour that goes by, there is one being built. Is this the proper use of our money? What does the federal government need 64,000 tactical helicopters for, if they are not trying to enslave us? I doubt if the entire military needs 64,000 worldwide. I doubt if all the world needs that many. There are 157 F-117A stealth aircraft loaded with LIDAR and computer-enhanced imaging radar. They can see you walking from room to room when they fly over your house. They see objects in the house from the air with a variation limit of 1 inch to 30,000 miles. That's how accurate it is. Now, I worked in the federal government for a long time, and I know exactly how they handled their business. On October 20, 1991, California researcher Michael Lindemann, founder of the 2020 Group, gave a lecture before a large crowd of interested investigators. During the course of his lecture, wherein he discussed the military-industrial complex's underground bases outside of Lancaster, California, he made the following statements. How many of you have seen the book Blank Check? It is not a UFO book. I strongly recommend that you read the book Blank Check so that you can understand something about how these projects are funded without your say-so, indeed without the say-so of Congress. Most citizens don't know for example that the National Security Act of 1947 made it illegal to ever say how much money is spent on the CIA. Indeed all of our tremendous alphabet soup collection of intelligence agencies. Whether you're talking about the CIA, or the NRO, or the NSA or the DIA, etc., all of them are in the same category. You cannot say how much these things cost. All you can do if you want to find out is add up the numbers on the budget that aren't assigned to anything that actually means anything. 
There are these huge categories that have tens of billions of dollars in them that say nothing but special projects. And every year the Congress dutifully passes this bloated budget that has some $300 billion or more with huge chunks of cash labeled like that, special projects, unusual stuff. $10 billion. Okay, well where does the unusual stuff money go? Well, it does go to unusual stuff, that's for sure, and one of the places it goes is that it goes into the underground bases. Indeed Tim, Tim Weiner, said recently since the publication of his book, Blank Check. More black budget money goes into underground bases than any other kind of work. Now I don't believe the 35 billion, which is the approximate size of the black budget money that you can find by analyzing the budget, I don't think that comes close to the real figure because there is absolutely unequivocal evidence that a great deal of additional money was generated in other ways, such as the surreptitious running of guns and drugs. And one wonderful example of that is coming to light with the BCCI scandal, which I hope you've heard of. A number of very high-ranking American officials are caught in the undertow of the Chi tidal wave. Even though these guys are tying to pull fast ones on an immense scale they are getting caught. These things don't always work. Indeed they are very, very vulnerable. Indeed this whole end game is very vulnerable and that's why they feel it requires such secrecy. The American people wouldn't stand for this stuff if they had the information. And that's the reason why we have to get the information out and take it seriously because it really is a matter of our money and our future that's being mortgaged here. But my friend who worked in the underground bases, who was doing sheet rock was down on, he thinks, approximately the 30th level underground. These bases are perhaps 30-35 stories deep ground scrapers. As I say they are not just mine shafts, these are huge, giant facilities. Many city blocks in circumference, able to house tens of thousands of people. One of them, the Yano facility, we were told. By the county fire department director, the county fire department chief who had to go in there to look at a minor fire infraction. There's a 400 car parking lot on the first level of the Yano facility, but cars never come in and out. Those are the cars that they use inside. Okay, so. A very interesting situation down there. Our guy was doing sheet rock on the 30th floor, maybe the 30th floor underground. He and his crew are working on a wall and right over here is an elevator door. The elevator door opens and, a kind of reflex action you look, and he saw three guys. Two of them, human engineers that he's seen before. And between them a guy that stood about eight to eight and one half feet tall. Green skin, reptilian features, extra long arms, wearing a lab coat, holding a clipboard. I tend to believe that story because, first of all because we have other stories like it but more importantly because he walked off the job that very day. And he was getting paid a great deal of money. If you're basically a sheetrock kind of guy, if you can do sheetrock in a place like that then you get paid way more than standard sheetrock wages, you can count on it. So, he walked off that job. His buddy on that same crew turned into an alcoholic shortly after. This is an extremely upsetting thing. You know, it wasn't like this alien jumped out and bit his head off or anything. It was just standing there for a few minutes, the doors closed. He has a feeling that that elevator was malfunctioning, otherwise he never would have seen that except by accident. Several people have referred to the underground as well as the operational connections between the Dulce base in New Mexico and the Dreamland base in Nevada, connections that exist via Dalgoy, Utah and Page, Arizona. From Dreamland slash Area 51 slash S4 these underground systems reportedly extend towards the Edwards Aff slash Lancaster slash Ta region where so many military industrial aerospace operations are being carried out. If alien forces are intent on taking control of this planet, then it would be logical for them to target our most strategic military industrial weapons research and development center. This might involve actual infiltration of our military industrial complexes and control of the line of command through mind control of specific and strategic personnel. In many cases patriotic Americans have become caught in the middle of this underground war between loyal American military personnel and alien or alien controlled personnel, as in the Dulce and the Groom Wars themselves. The deeper one descends into the underground alien empire the greater the security and therefore the greater the control will be. Michael Reconosciuto, a former Walken Hut employee, claims that at Area 51 when one goes past a certain level of security they are either dead or disappear. Reconosciuto's father Marshall Reconosciuto was a Hitler supporter and a close friend of Fred L. Chrisman, who was involved with the Maury Island incident, 
was an agent of military industrial intelligence, and was in turn a close friend of Clayshaw, who Louisiana District Attorney James Garrison accused of being the CIA Mafia go-between in the John F. Kennedy assassination. Garrison might have convicted Clayshaw if not for the fact that Garrison's star witness David Ferry was killed a few days before he was to testify at Clayshaw's trial. Anyway, Michael Reconosciuto told reporters that when he worked for Wackenhut at the Nevada test site before he was framed on drug charges and put in a federal prison, he and several others tried to get damning evidence and documents out of the base on a helicopter, data apparently dealing with unconstitutional biogenetic activities, alien interaction in the underground facilities, etc. This helicopter was shot down before it could leave the base and the five people on board were killed. How many brave freedom-loving Americans have to die before we finally wake up from our apathetic skepticism and realize that we are at war? Must we have a repeat of the Holocaust, and only after the fact hear such pitiful excuses like those that followed World War II? Quotes yes, we heard the reports about the concentration camps, but they seemed too fantastic to be believed, so we didn't bother bombing the ovens or the train tracks leading to the death camps. Or maybe underground bases and concentration camps that have undermined America, where Nazis and aliens are working together in a joint effort to impose a global dictatorship on this planet. Come on, how were we supposed to have believed something so fantastic? When all is said and done I will probably be seen as one of America's greatest heroes or one of the nation's most notorious fools. To tell you the truth I could really care less. I would rather be seen as a fool rather than risk the lives of thousands or possibly millions of people who might turn out to be the potential victims of a cosmic conspiracy which I perceive to be taking place, one which has specifically targeted America and her citizens. So then, at the risk of being a fool, I'll just go for broke and expose those specific areas where I perceive the collaboration maintains underground strongholds, based on what I have learned through years of research, personal experience and interaction with others who have their own stories to tell about such an underground invasion of North America. Within the United States, the following joint operational bases, operating under the control of Bavarian and Draconian intelligence agencies, have been identified by various researchers, beginning with the major facility near Dulce, New Mexico. Other facilities of this nature include, Page, Arizona, Dowgue, Utah, Nevada Test Site, the Madigan facility near Fort Lewis, Washington. Deep Springs, California. Mount Lassen, California. Lancaster, California. Montauk, Long Island. The Denver International Airport. Granite Mountain, Little Cottonwood Canyon, Salt Lake City, Utah. Sleeping Ute Mountain on the Ute Reservation of SE Utah. Creed, Colorado. Other underground facilities for the New World Order itself are apparently occupied exclusively by lower ranking levels of the collaboration which are nevertheless controlled by the serpent cult of humanoid and reptiloid collaborators in the joint operational facilities. Many of the closed military bases in the United States possess underground facilities which are occupied by UN troops from various countries. Several federal buildings in many major cities also reportedly have underground facilities equipped with massive military weapons stushes, such as the Oklahoma City Federal Building which contains a 15-level base underneath, which was revealed during the initial local reports of the bombing of the federal building there, although these references to the underground tunnels were censored by the time the story reached national and international audiences. Since Oklahoma City and airport are intended to be a major famous slash U dot N, Relocation Processing Center, one has to ask just which side had stashed the underground arsenals there, the American or New World Order government? Also FEMA itself maintains several underground facilities, many of them located beneath major airports throughout the United States. Could America be facing a fourfold invasion force in the future? Via air, sea, land as well as an invasion from the underground networks of the military industrial complex? the United Nations and the United States. The following information comes from a research source which has investigated actual United Nations preparations within the United States to deal with any resistance to a New World Order takeover. Take note that FEMA is a major New World Order front with several extensive operational underground bases which, like underground Trojan horses, exist beneath strategic locations throughout the United States, Fenson confirmed pre-deployment locations, South and East Central California, West Central Montana, North Texas, West Central Wisconsin, Northeast Illinois, Southeast Michigan, Central Indiana, Southwest Ohio, 
North New York, South Delaware, South Maryland, Northeast Virginia, Northeast North Carolina, Central, South Florida. All Fenson equipment is black, Fenson uniforms, helicopters, etc. Fenson are foreign military and secret police brought into the United States for deployment against the, the United States citizens. Most identified Fenson units are AT Company Strength 160 plus. Some are as large as Brigade Strength 2600 plus. Fenson's mission is A. House to house search and seizure of property and arms. B. Separation and categorization of men, women and children as prisoners in large numbers. C. Transfer to detention facilities of aforementioned prisoners. Confirmed MJTF Multi-Jurisdictional Task Force Police Locations, Northwest Washington. Central, South California. Southwest, Southeast, North Wyoming. North, Northwest, Southwest Nebraska. North Texas. Southeast Missouri. West Central, Southeast Wisconsin. Northeast Illinois. Central, Southeast Michigan. Central Indiana. North Central Kentucky. South, Southwest Ohio. North, Southeast New York. South Central North Carolina. West Central Georgia. Southeast Florida. Central. Alaska. The MJTF is the Velvet Glove on the Iron Fist, motto on the cover page of the MJTF Guidelines and Authorizing Legislation. The MJTF police is made up of 1. Military, converts those National Guard units that are not banned by the President, into a National Police Force. 2. Converts all surviving local and state police to National Police. 3. Converts street gangs into law enforcement units for house-to-house -house searches. Louisiana, Chicago, and New York are in the process now. MJTF Police Mission 1. House-to-house -house search and seizure of property and firearms. 2. Separation and categorization of men, women and children as prisoners in large numbers. 3. Transfer to and the operation of detention camps in the, the United States 43 plus camps. United Nations Combat Groups confirmed locations. East Central, South California. Northwest, West, Southwest Montana. South Arizona. North Texas. East Michigan. North, Southeast New York. North New Jersey. Northwest, North Central, Northeast North Carolina. West Central Georgia. United Nations Battle Group's entrance to United States passed under presidential executive orders signed the 11th of November 1990. Note. There are those who are convinced that with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy a coup d'etat took place within the executive branch of the America government via internationalist groups who are determined to destroy the, the United States Constitution, and that the presidents who were manipulated into office since that time, mostly CFR and TLC members, have signed numerous unconstitutional executive orders designed to pave the way for America's assimilation into a global dictatorship. If this is the case, then Americans have the constitutional right to resist this foreign UN, NWO government, a right which is also laid down in the Declaration of Independence. As for the Kennedy assassination itself and those behind it, Louisiana District Attorney James Garrison in an interview with Playboy magazine made the following statement in regards to Lee Harvey Oswald. Our office has positively identified a number of his associates as neo-Nazis. Oswald would have been more at home with Mein Kampf than Das Kapital. Ironically, the Mafia agent who was assigned to kill the Patsy Oswald, Jack Ruby, was one of these neo-Nazis, according to Garrison. Branton detention facilities authorized through FEMA and augmented by Dodd budget amendment passed with 1991 fiscal budget, North, Southwest, Southeast Wyoming. Northwest, Northeast, South Nebraska. North, Central, Texas. Central Wisconsin. Central, Southwest, South, Southeast Michigan. Northeast, West Central, South Indiana. Northwest, Northeast, Central, South Ohio. West, North, East New York. Each site can detain between 32,000 to 44,000 people minutes. B. It is indicated that the Texas and Alaskan sites may be much larger and more heavily armed. C. For the areas west of the Mississippi, Oklahoma City is the central processing point for detainees and can handle up to 100,000 people at a time. D. The Eastern Processing Center is not yet identified at this time. Detention facilities, dash dash 23 FEMA authorized and stationed. Dash dash 20 DOD, Department of Defense, budget authorized and stationed. 43 total. Note, 
In Red China an untold number of people are suffering in communist Volga camps as slave laborers. In Soviet Russia it was the Gulag camps. In Nazi Germany the concentration camps were not only used as slave camps, but also as extermination camps to carry out the genocidal plans of American corporate and European militant Nazis. I have only one thing to say concerning these plans for confinement camps here in America, and I'm sure that many of our Jewish American citizens who share this country with us, that is with all of us of all national backgrounds whose ancestors came from all parts of the world in order to be free from tyranny, will agree with me wholeheartedly when I repeat their battle cry, never again. The Federal Emergency Management Agency. From Patriot Archives. Although an excellent article, the January 1995 edition of Monitoring Times magazine published only a tiny portion of what FEMA has been tasked by executive order to perform. FEMA was brought into existence by oh, all the frequencies I have for FEMA follow my comments here, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and other emergency agencies, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency has been authorized for the past 15 years by presidential executive orders to confiscate all property from the American people, separate families and the current 43 internment camps already built and operational by the way, five of which are located in Georgia. The largest can confine somewhere on the order of 100,000 American citizens, called relocation camps by the government, for assignment to work camps. Declares martial law and totally overrides the, the United States Constitution. Presidential executive orders that are related or control this are given at the end of this. Two of the state prisons here in Georgia are currently empty, although manned by a minimal number of staff have been set up and intentionally unpopulated by prisoners just to support this political policy concentration internment camps. An executive order signed by then President Bush in 1989 authorized the Federal Emergency Management Agency FEMA to build 43 primary camps having a capacity of 35,000 to 45,000 prisoners each and also authorized hundreds of secondary facilities. It is interesting to note that several of these facilities can accommodate 100,000 prisoners. These facilities have been completed and many are already manned but as yet contain no prisoners. Remember all the talk of overcrowded prisons that exist. In South Georgia there are several state prisons that except for a few guards, are completely devoid of prisoners. Under FEMA, the executive orders which are already written and is the current law of the land, calls for the complete suspension of the United States Constitution, all rights and liberties, as they are currently known. The following executive orders, which are in the Federal Register located in Washington, D.C. for anyone to request copies of, call for the suspension of all civil rights and liberties and for extraordinary measures to be taken in, as most of the orders state, any national security emergency situation that might confront the government. When FEMA is implemented, the following executive orders will be immediately enforced, EO 12148, FEMA national security emergency, such as, national disaster, social unrest, insurrection, or national financial crisis. E.O. 10,995 provides for the seizure of all communications media in the United States. E.O. 10,997 provides for the seizure of all electric power, petroleum, gas, fuels and minerals, both public and private. E.O. 10,998 provides for the seizure of all food supplies and resources, public and private and all farms, lands, and equipment. EO 10,999 provides for the seizure of all means of transportation, including personal cars, trucks or vehicles of any kind, and total control over all highways, seaports, and waterways. EO 11,000 provides for the seizure of all American people for workforces under federal supervision, including splitting up of families if the government has to. EO 11,001 provides for government seizure of all health, education and welfare functions. EO 11002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. Under this order, you would report to your local post office to be separated and assigned to a new area. Here is where families would be separated. EO 11003 provides for the government to take over all airports and aircraft, commercial, public and private. EO 11004 provides for the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate communities, designate areas to be abandoned and establish new locations for populations. EO 11005 provides for the government to take over railroads, 
inland waterways, and public storage facilities. EO 11051. The Office of Emergency Planning has complete authorization to put the above orders into effect in time of increased international tension or economic or financial crisis. All of the above executive orders were combined by President Nixon into Executive Order 11490, which allows all of this to take place if a national emergency is declared by the President. The burning and insurrection in Los Angeles in the case of Rodney King could have executed and partially did execute these executive orders. Executive Order 12919, National Defense Industrial Resources Preparedness, signed by Clinton June 3, 1994, Delegates Authorities, Responsibilities and Allocations of FEMA's Executive Orders, Last Entry, for the confiscation of all property from the American people, and their relocation and assignment to labor camps. The Executive Order also supersedes or revokes 11, 11 previous Executive Orders from 1939 through 1991, Annaman's Executive Order 10,789 and 11,790. This Executive Order is a declaration of war against the American people by the secret government of the United States in concert with the United Nations. Operation Dragnet. Janet Reno can implement this operation upon receiving one call from the President. Arrest warrants will be issued via computer to round up over one million patriotic Americans who may resist the New World Order. Americans who are not politically correct. Specifically mentioned are Christians or those who read the Bible. Concentration slash internment camps have already been built to accommodate these American prisoners. See above paragraph as these internment camps have been set up and are run by FEMA. Note, in reference to Christians, just where should they slash we stand in regards to defending America? Should Christians take up arms if necessary? Apparently the Founding Fathers of the American Republic believed so, so long as it was in order to defend their country, their women and children. And not in order to engage in offensive warfare for the sake of conquering and exploiting others, which to me would be living by the sword, or you could say, making a living by the sword. This could be exemplified by the Germans, who initiated unprovoked invasions of their neighbors to meet their economic needs during World Wars I and II. One might ask, what about all the Orthodox Jews and Greek Orthodox Christians who went to their deaths like lambs to the slaughter without resisting during World War II? Why didn't they fight more zealously to defend themselves? That is a hard question and one that I don't have an answer for. It may have simply come down to a lack of unity of faith and understanding of the threat. All I can say is that from my study of the Old and New Testaments, I find no passage that forbids us from defending ourselves from aggressors, at least in a national sense. However we are forbidden to become the unprovoked aggressors ourselves or engage in conflicts which are offensive rather than defensive oriented. The offensive attacks against the Native Americans for instance, resulting from the Anglo invasion of North America, cannot be justified through scripture, and such policies and mistreatment of the Native Americans, the continuous betrayal of treaties, and the stealing of their God-given land in the past have or will doubtless have an adverse effect on America's destiny unless reparations are made to the Native peoples for instance a restoration of historical territories. Perhaps the Greys felt justified in repeatedly violating our government's secret treaties with them because we had done the exact same thing to the Native Americans? Perhaps we in part deserved the abuses that the Greys have inflicted upon us. Perhaps our nation's destiny will be largely determined by how we treat the Native Americans from here on out, whether or not we begin to honor all of the treaties that we had made and broken in the past. Could it be? On the other hand, if offensive warfare is forbidden by God, then defensive warfare against a foreign invasion of American soil, or an internal threat to our freedoms, as guaranteed in the Bill of Rights would, from my perspective, be justified. In Psalm 125, 3 we read how the rule of the wicked is a direct violation of the will of God. For the wicked shall not rule the godly, lest the godly be forced to do wrong. A perfect example would be the Lutherans of Germany who all too often capitulated to the Nazis who themselves were backed by Luciferian cults which the Christians should have resisted. Instead, many of these backsliding Christians in Germany grudgingly supported the atrocities of their Nazi leaders, and by default the extermination of millions of Jewish, Gypsy and Slavic men, women and children. Why could Martin Luther himself stand alone against hundreds of pompous religious hypocrites at the Council of Worms in Germany and boldly accuse them of blasphemy to their faces, yet many of his Protestant followers, not detracting from those few brave souls who did resist, gave it right and left to the Nazi Satanists, 
and in some cases even contributed to the atrocities of World Wars I and II. So in short, if a situation exists wherein an offender or a defender must die, one or the other so that the other could live, then the defender would be the one who should keep his or her life. In warfare, the invader should be considered a murderer for killing a human being. Whereas if the invader took the life of an invader, it should be considered execution in retribution for the murderous acts of the invaders themselves. All of this would be justified in the name of and according to the rules of the society which gives the defending citizens the power to defend his or her country, just as one is authorized to use deadly force against an unwelcome intruder into their home if they feel their life is being threatened. The only exception to this would be an offensive invasion of an allied country which has been invaded by an enemy force, or the selective invasion of an enemy country in order to rescue allied citizens who are being held within a targeted region, as an underground basis for instance. In which case the invasion should be considered a form of self-defense on behalf of their own citizens, so long as the invader remains in a mode of offensive defense. Branton. Operation Rolling Thunder. Reno and Benson have mentioned this operation, which comprises county-wide sweeps of house-to-house, -house, dynamic entry, search and seizures for all guns and food stockpiles by BATF, State National Guard, activity duty soldiers, as well as local police. This function is also run and coordinated through F. E. M. A. Public Law 100-690 banned almost all religious gatherings not yet enforced. Note, when and if this is enforced, this will be a blatant defecation upon the Bill of Rights, and in this event every true American is allowed, and in fact it will be his and her patriotic duty, to implement the clause within the Declaration of Independence to overthrow such an alien or foreign tyranny structure which has like a tapeworm infested the governing body of America. Branton? grants no knock search and seizures without a search warrant. Expands the drug laws to include every American. This will generally be the prelude, or in addition to, a FEMA operation and contingency plan implementation. The Omnibus Crime Bill of 1990. Ensures confiscation of all private property via money laundering, environmental violations of the Clean Water and Air Act, and extends as far as child abuse. This act also coordinates activities through FEMA and the Department of the Army. Commanding General, the United States Forces Command, Fort McPherson, Georgia which is the executive and implementing agency upon initiation of many of these acts. The responsible agency within the United States Army Forces Command was what used to be known as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, Plans Division, TSOPS, Plans, which was changed several years ago to J3 after the headquarters became a joint headquarters. They keep on file copies of all FEMA emergency management operation plans including those plans developed by the Army to support the FEMA plan to eliminate the, the United States Constitution upon implementation. According to current plans, the Constitution will be temporarily discontinued and shelved until the real or perceived and declared threat has been neutralized. Ask yourself, who or what is the real threat that needs to be neutralized? Branton. But once shelved, as with almost every other action of the government, it stays shelved. The Crime Bill of 1994 Banning of all military weapons which are necessary to the formation of a militia when needed, Denny's other military equipment to the people's militia units, that's okay. The average American gun owner can legally acquire this equipment from off the dead bodies of UN slash FEMA backed Gestapo forces when they break into our homes to steal our personal property or try to take us and our families prisoner without due process of law. Branton, prelude to confiscating all guns in the hands of private citizens, destroys the First Amendment and makes virtually every American an outlaw. See above comments concerning the house-to-house -house search. The agency responsible for the actual implementation and search is the Department of the Army in concert with local and state police, including FEMA, FBI, BATF, and other federal agencies. Secret underground bases. There have been documented over 60 secret, virtual cities, underground, built by the government, Federal Reserve Bank owners such as the Rockefellers, etc. Branton, and the high-ranking members of the Committee of 300. Some of these underground areas can be seen in Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas. In addition, there exist underground satellite tracking facilities which have the ability to puncture a 911 address into the computer and a satellite can within seconds bring a camera to bear on your property to the point that those monitoring can read a license number on an automobile on your driveway. These facilities have as of October 1, 1994, been turned over to the foreign power of the United Nations. Note, forget the license plate, 
According to information released by Norio Hayakawa, this satellite technology is now so sophisticated that they can clearly read every word on your driver's license supposing it were in view of the satellite. Branton, the Bavarian Illuminati. At this point we will discuss present plans by the Bavarian Illuminati and other Bavarian cults to stage an invasion of America under the cover of a United Nations New World Order operation to restore order to America in the event of an internal emergency, a staged emergency of course. The real motive would be to destroy every last vestige of patriotism and resistance to the New World Order. For those who are not familiar with George Washington's famous vision at Valley Forge, I would highly recommend that you locate a copy since the vision correctly predicted the outcome of the Revolutionary War, the Civil War and its outcome, and the third trial that America must pass through before it enters into its ultimate destiny. Following this war according to Washington, no power on earth, in heaven, or in hell would be able to stand against her divine destiny. Compare this prophecy with the prophecy in Revelation chapter 12. Could America be the wilderness mentioned in that chapter? Also compare that prophecy with the fact that America and Israel harbor more Jewish citizens than any other nations on earth, more or less equally distributed between the two. Washington, in this angelic vision, saw a dark red cloud rise out of Europe, the Middle East, Africa and Asia. This cloud carried a massive army with it and this army then invaded American soil and commenced to engage the citizens of America in battle, as the nation was engulfed in the dark cloud. He saw most of the major cities in flames. The Americans rallied their forces in a common defense and from their newfound unity of purpose they continued to fight, according to the vision. According to other private visions that are not as well known, yet which confirm Washington's own vision. The Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains west of the Mississippi will apparently be the heart of the Free America Zone where the true Americans will make their stand, and those areas east of the Mississippi River will be the hardest hit by the occupying forces. Those border areas north, south and west of the Rocky slash Great Plains may also be threatened, however Washington's vision did not go into detail on this, neither did he see exactly how long the battle would last. In the vision he was shown that near the end of the war, when the American resistance seemed to be well nigh overcome, divine intervention would bring about an American victory as legions of white spirits descended to join the Americans in battle. The broken ranks would be refortified and the American militia would go on the offensive and eventually drive the enemy into the sea. This would apparently coincide with the destruction of the power base of the New World Order in Europe which would also be the result of divine intervention in keeping with the apocalyptic prophecies of the Book of Revelation. Just who were these white spirits that General Washington saw in his vision? I recall an interesting sermon I heard from a Pentecostal evangelist years ago. He claimed that he was friends with some government scientists with high-level security clearances. It seems as if they had detected, with powerful electronic telescopes, a brilliant and beautiful star-like object emerging from the vortex within the Orion Nebula. This nebula is several hundred light years beyond the Orion open cluster itself, which is in line of sight between Sol and the nebula. From our perspective this awesome nebula is the middle star in Orion's dagger, which hangs from Orion's belt. Some have interpreted this to be the area that Lucifer referred to as the sides of the north, which was the ultimate target of his war against the Creator and his vain desire to conquer the heavens and the throne of the Almighty One. Others have referred to this vortex in the Orion nebula as the Eternity Gate because they believe it leads to the eternal realm of the Creator which exists beyond our time-space material universe. This brilliant object however is on a direct course to the Sol system and Earth, according to these scientists, which means that it will eventually pass through the core of the Orion Cluster. This does not mean that the Angelus forces who are believed to reside in this awesome city of light must wait for this to take place to wage their war in heaven against the unholy Six Empire of Orion, as some Federation worlds refer to it because of the six draconian controlled star systems which make up its core, being that the angelic light beings can travel at the speed of thought and enter any point in time space instantaneously. However even though this city of light is on a direct course to Earth, at its present rate of speed, according to this evangelist, it will not arrive here until sometime around 3000 AD or the end of the millennium, all according to the perfect timing of the Creator. The Final Invasion of the United States? By Dr. Al Overholt. January of 1997. From, Stop All Federal Abuses Now. S. A. F. A. N. Internet Newsletter. No. 129. November 15, 1996. Take note on how the New World Order is trying to incite civil war between British Columbia and French Quebec, Canada, 
and use this emergency as an excuse to activate unconstitutional executive orders in America. This has not been the first attempt to create an emergency that would justify martial law in America, and if this one fails, then it will certainly not be the last attempt. I take this report very seriously, being that my own ancestors were Frenchmen who became British citizens and later immigrated to America. Just what force would try to create a civil war between French Quebec, British Columbia and America? Could it be, just possibly, that same force which was responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of French, British and American Allied soldiers during World War I and World War II? Branton. The Coming Invasion of America. Posted by Roger D. Cravens. RBG at dosa1.em.cdc.gov. The following is most of the message printed in the Prophecy Club newsletter from intelligence sources in Canada and New England. Quoting Preparations for the Coming Invasion of America by Russian slash new forces are progressing rapidly in Canada. As candidly admitted to me by many Canadians, including author and lecturer Grant Jeffrey of Final Warning and many other books explaining the coming New World Order takeover, Canada is totally sold out to the new and its heinous agenda of world domination. Note, I would suggest that this statement is somewhat extreme. Certainly those advocates of a New World Order operating within certain executive levels of Canadian government are sold out to the agenda but no more so than the advocates for the new operating within various executive levels of the American government. It is obvious that the majority of Canadians and Americans desire to maintain their national independence, and it is these who the advocates of the New World Order are apparently willing to sacrifice in the devastating civil wars that they have planned for America and Canada. We must realize that just as there is an electorate and a secret government within America, the same holds true with Canada as well. Branton. America has long been a thorn in the flesh of the new planners, because of our Christian heritage and its isolation from Europe. With little over three years left to move this Western Hemisphere into their new agenda by the year 2000, they are making rapid use of Canada's new advocates' willingness to betray America into their control. How is this taking place? Canada has opened her doors wide to new forces, including German, Russian and Chinese. As Grant Jeffery admitted to me personally one month ago, we have more German military forces in Canada now than we do Canadian military forces. Emphasis mine. Indeed, for next to dislike, Canada, Germans have been handed a military airbase for their use. They are actively practicing bombing and strafing runs for the coming invasion of America. Much as they are doing down at Holloman Afb, which has been permanently turned over to the Germans in New Mexico. The traitorous new elements within our own government are fully aware of the motives of these German new forces both in Canada and America and welcome their presence into the Western Hemisphere as part of the solution to subduing patriotic Americans who simply refuse to surrender national sovereignty to a foreign power. Russian and Chinese forces are also very active in Canada. They are rebuilding and strengthening railroad tracks for the anticipated heavy use of railway transportation of incoming military personnel from the West Coast, both Russian and Chinese forces, as well as transporting military vehicles and armaments and food supplies. New tracks are also being laid between border states and Canada. Those people who are arrested as resistors or dissidents will also be transported in specially prepared prisoner boxcars to the death camps already established near the border, such as the one near Cut Bank. Mount the death camp outside of Cut Bank has been conveniently located right off a major Amtrak express line in the anticipation of transporting resistors and dissidents conveniently to their deaths by rail. Reports have been received from intel sources nationwide which indicate that certain boxcars are quietly being renovated from the inside so that they can be used for prisoner transport to such death camps. Preparations noted by eyewitnesses include shackles being bolted into the walls to restrain those taken prisoner until they reach their final destination. From our intelligence source in Florida, we know that Russian train engineer experts are already being trained in how to operate American engines and how our rail system functions. Russian railway procedures differ from American. As least 50 Russian engineers are in training presently in Jacksonville, Florida. Many others are apparently being trained in other locations as well. Note, some have alleged that the sudden fall of the Soviet states and the Berlin Wall was planned in advance as part of an agenda to merge the East and the West into a so-called democratic socialist slash communist socialist New World Order. East and West Berlin would be at the forefront for the reunification of Eastern and Western Europe and in turn, they hope, the rest of the world. Germany has also led the way for European unification by establishing an open border policy and encouraging other European countries to do the same.
This may sound benign on the outside but considering the facts it may be a ruse to unify Europe under German control, which was actually Adolf Hitler's goal. However in this case the unification is being accomplished through economic means rather than military means. The control is still in Germany but it is more subtle. The Third Reich established German military control of Europe. The European Economic Community or EC established economic control. In most cases, in this world it is the economic forces which control governments. Sad, but true. Notice how the term economic has now been removed and the new world order has been renamed the European Community. Very clever. In other words the unification is no longer just along economic lines but is becoming increasingly political, since the member nations have been pressured into submitting to an EC constitution along more than mere economic lines. France and England have been pulled into this alliance, in spite of two devastating world wars with the country that is secretly orchestrating the EC, aka the New World Order. Come on France and England, get a clue. Germany is not only the largest federated state in the EC, but in 1990 was the largest economic power in the world, with a trade surplus totaling over $58 billion. With almost no foreign currency reserves in 1949, Germany had accumulated nearly $80 billion in reserves by 1989, compared with the $38 billion in the USA and $41 billion in Great Britain. A rather incredible comeback for a country that had waged two world wars for the sole purpose of offensive conquest, wars that it cost the Allies a heavy price in blood and resources. Of course Germany is also the leading economic power in the EC as well, possessing 35% of the economic power base of the European community according to the Grolier Encyclopedia. So just where does the real power lie in the EC slash N? W. O. Considering that the German black nobility who have controlled vast financial empires for over 1500 years and have ruled the unholy Roman Empire for centuries, were the same ones who sent Vladimir Lenin from Germany to Russia to start the communist revolution, and the same powers who backed Adolf Hitler. Then it is not surprising that communist East Germany would merge into democratic West Germany with such ease. It should not be surprising, therefore, to learn that German troops in the United States and Canada play a major role in the planned invasion of North America, since after all most of the New World Order agenda had its roots in Bavaria region of Germany. Most do not realize that Adolf Hitler's second book, after he wrote Mein Kampf, was titled, Believe It or Not, The New World Order. Branton. Already seen being transported on these train lines are huge power generators to various locations in Canada, in anticipation of the planned power outages that will be triggered deliberately both in Canada and America as the planned takeover methodically takes place. Incredibly. We now have information that, all emphasis mine, below, the Russians have finally succeeded in bridging the gap between Siberia and Alaska through a vast underground tunnel. The Bering Sea between Alaska and Asia is under 100 miles wide at its narrowest point, so this would not be an inconceivable undertaking, Branton. Although documented in more than one newspaper report in Western Canada, the American news media has remained silent on this feat. Russian civilians are known to be coming through this tunnel. 100 per month, plus heavy military artillery. Also, there is yet another tunnel that has been built from Siberia to northern Canada, this one being used for railroad transportation purposes. Note, it is interesting that several underground tunnels have been discovered by American troops which originate in North Korea and run under the border, emerging at different points in the border region of South Korea. Some of these tunnels are well built and modern and could accommodate massive troop movements. It appears that North Korea may be planning something for the future, possibly in conjunction with the Russian-Chinese plans mentioned above. A the United States Air Force officer who wrote an expose on UN betrayal of America forces during the Korean and Vietnam wars has stated that based on intelligence data he has gathered, those Vietnamese boat people who escaped to America after, not before, North Vietnam took control of the South, were an die-hard communists. The reason for this is that when the North took control of the South of Vietnam they immediately hunted down all known anti-communist activists and sympathizers and exterminated them. In other words the boat people who left Vietnam following the purge were mostly communist infiltrators masquerading as people who were escaping the communists. The USAF officer claimed that these infiltrators are involved in the plan to bring down America and that they have been accumulating and storing huge weapon stashes in anticipation for the time when they will be called into action to join their comrades in their war against America. Branton. 
the extent of the American government's, the corporate fascist military industrial government, as opposed to the constitutional or electorate government, betrayal of her citizens can be further evidenced in the fact that these Chinese and Russian forces are receiving payment for their pre-invasion activities through the International Monetary Fund, issued on American government checks, in anticipation of the coming invasion from Russia and China and German, U. N. forces, etc. Canada has even gone so far as to disband its Western Coast Guard Division, thus they are open to amphibious invasion of America from the West. This was openly evidenced recently through the presentation of a documentary report over the BBC television in London which detailed amphibious assault forces practicing war maneuvers and strategy in the Formosa Straits. When BBC newsmen were permitted to interview these soldiers in training, they repeatedly asked them the following question. What are you preparing to use this training for? The sure king, consistent reply was, for the coming invasion of America. When it became clear that a gaffe in security was created by airing this broadcast over television in England, its scheduled rebroadcast for the next day in London was hastily cancelled. Note, so then, for our readers in our west coast, and especially Hawaiian naval bases, take notice. You are the last line and front line of defense against such an action. Remember Pearl Harbor and learn from the mistakes of the past. Branton, speculate no more on the suspicious suicide of Admiral Michael Burda, former director of the, the United States Naval Forces. I was informed he was terminated because of his refusal to cooperate in the covert plan by our traitorous new forces within our own government to assist in the coming invasion of America. When he refused to go along with the plan to covertly being Chinese forces into America through use of our own Navy vessels, orders were given from on high to terminate him. The message is clear. This message is to inform those who may not know the magnitude of the New World Order and its massive agenda. The following accompanied the above information, in the newsletter from which these reports were taken. The following articles are excerpts taken from advertisement flyers put out by Serge Monist. They have short news bites of very interesting information that I feel is worth pondering. For those who haven't heard yet, Serge Monist was recently dead and killed for his daring exposes of the elite. His son was kidnapped shortly before he was killed, also because of his exposing their dastardly deeds and plans to make most of us their slaves. Soon. I don't have any information whether or not any of his reports are available since he has transitioned to the heavenly realms. Al. FEMA, Red Iron Plan, Nationwide State of Emergency, National State, Sovereignty Endangered. Excerpted from the International Free Press Agency, Report, 1296, quoting, forwarded message from, UN Military Confidential Source. Center, International Free Press Agency, Fax, 1-819-888-2949. Reply to, International Free Press Agency, Fax, 1-819-888-2949. To, please forward this crucial information to all networks, world, national. Date, December 3, 1996. Time 1500 hours Greenwich Mean Time. Extremely urgent. Red alert confirmed high UN sensitive military information. Note, please pay close attention to this one. Know that foreign troops are in standby. They are daggers pointed at the heart of our homeland and society. This is real. That's only the beginning. Red Iron FEMA preparedness. FEMA, Red Iron FEMA plan slash nationwide state of emergency slash national state sovereignty endangered. Storm warning in America. Department of the Army. FEMA, FBI, BATF, state and local police and other federal agencies involved knowingly or unknowingly. The IRA map regions correspond exactly, by location and number, to the FEMA regions. IRA map, an EPA program, stands for Regional Map. UN's Global Biodiversity Assessment, but for UN's Foreign Troops Global Training Centers and Detention Facilities Areas. Bring about national disaster by all means, social unjustified unrest into black communities. National financial crisis as a result of massive budget cuts, national social crisis blamed upon militia and religious groups before the end of 1997. One million patriotic Americans who may resist the new world order and Americans who are not politically correct are already listed and targeted to be arrested. Specifically mentioned are Christian followers of those who run talk shows throughout the country and churches not under federal control. Very high secret of United Nations military plans never released before. Top confidential at high political level. 
Also concern Russian and foreign troops deployment and occupation of the United States territory under United Nations Military Command. FEMA, UN Multi-Jurisdictional Police Slash Military Operation to neutralize all patriotic and Christian organizations in America before the end of 1997. FEMA canceled their scheduled dog. Slash set. 1996 exercises and changed it to the period between Jan. Slash March 1997 which linked to Philadelphia Phase 3 to start in Eastern Canada during the same period. High-ranking politicians and military involved. Strong link between main roads to be used by foreign troops stationed in Mexico and Canada and detention facilities areas, biodiversity areas, some military bases and railroad centers. End quoting. Countdown to the 1997 Northern Showdown. Excerpted from Red Alert Report. Og. Single quote 96, quoting, international cross-checking verified sources and other absolute reliable and unprecedented sources of documentation dated June 1996 tell us that this time is for real. No fiction, no imagination, no process of deduction. The top secret scenario we now have in our hands is just beyond everything ever imagined before. We can surely state that no one else anywhere has the full complete picture with all accurate details of what has been carefully planned at the highest level of the world politics and economic elite for something big to happen in 1997 which will disrupt life of millions of people. With full, well-documented documents strongly supported by various serious unknown politics and military hard evidence files copies and actual documents for a major prearranged chaos, we know why. How and when a declaration of a national state of emergency and though the United States will emerge during night time, and which are the 19 states that will be placed under martial law. What will be the precise military agenda in the targeted states for FEMA, foreign UN battle groups, FENSON, MJTF and BAF troops? What are the names of these people in Canada? and though the United States and throughout the world who planned and finalized the 1997 scenario? You might think you know something. Beware of what you always think which might not be this time. What will really happen? Knowledge is the best protection. Us or ask no one can protect themselves if they are unaware how their rights are threatened. End quoting. Recent news from the Partisan Rangers of Ohio. Excerpted from Serge Manus International Free Press Agency, the Partisan Rangers of Ohio, August 14, 1996, quoting. United States Military Command Office. MAG. General Darren Day, Canada, on August 14, 1996, the Canadian Serge Monist was interviewed on the Steve Quayle SW radio program 9400. Our Colonel Watchman supplied a summary as follows, the Russian ID system is probing before invasion to test the strength of police units. Create havoc, such as riots, to see what the reaction is. See the reaction of the people. Create confrontations with the militia and patriot groups to test their response. The East Coast is the start of this invasion. New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, brand new units specializing in search and seizure, round ups, Cold War weather and Arctic prepared. The 82nd Airborne, Mountain Division, Watertown, New York, same preparedness, with these two units they can close off the St. Lawrence Seaway. Invasion routes, from Nova Scotia through Maine, across the borders. The Champion Paper Company is cutting trees on the mountains closest to the Canadian border, creating a clear area to the border before the mountains. They are also spreading herbicides. Satellite motion sensor detection equipment to be installed in area. Phase 1 of Project Philadelphia is about two-thirds completed. Rise in prices, shortages of food, power outages, civil unrest. Expect a price doubling in your staple food items. Phase 3, Quebec Hydro shutdown. This is the sixth largest electric power plant in the world, and controls all electricity east of the Mississippi. Scheduled to go down any time from Jan. Slash March. An induced outage during the cold of winter. Winter of single quote 97, single quote 98 or a following winter. Branton would create the most hardships and be a major emergency crisis condition. There were two very high-ranking Quebec hydro engineers aboard Ron Brown's plane. Keep your eyes on Canada. End quoting. Conclusion in Philadelphia Phase 3. And from an article titled, Top Secret New World Order Plan, from the same publication. Television commentator Bill Moyers found out during a 15-day, 
globe-spanning trip in the company of David Rockefeller that just about a dozen or fifteen individuals made day-to-day -day decisions that regulated the flow of capital and goods throughout the entire world. He quotes Bill Moyers himself as saying, David Rockefeller is the most conspicuous representative today of the ruling class, a fraternity of men who shape the global economy and manage the flow of its capital. Rockefeller was born to it, and he has made the most of it. But what some critics see as a vast international conspiracy, he considers a circumstance of life and just another day's work. In the world of David Rockefeller it's hard to tell where business ends and politics begin. Cannot we say the same thing about the executive branch of the, the United States government? It's hard to tell where politics ends and the corporate, military, industrial government begins. Later in the same publication, in reference to Philadelphia Phase 3, we read, the basic scenario finalized at the June 1996 meeting in Toronto, and completed with other reliable sources, is as follows. 1. Quebec makes its unilateral declaration of independence between January and March 1997. This situation provides the trigger for the catastrophic and irreversible breakup of Canada and the declaration of a national state of emergency in the eastern and northeastern part of the United States. Note, those British citizens within British Columbia and Quebec can prevent a civil war by doing the last thing that the New World Order advocates expect, that is they can do nothing. If you refuse to go to war against your Canadian brothers and sisters of Quebec then there will be no civil war. The only ones left to fight will be the German military units occupying Canada, you know, the same guys who killed Frenchmen, Britons and Americans in the last two world wars. Whether or not you believe Quebec should have its independence, you must ask yourself, what would be more preferable? An independent Quebec, or a devastating civil war that will end in the destruction of both British Columbia and Quebec and the assimilation of all of Canada into the New World Order? If war breaks out between the New World Order and North-South America, the republics of British Columbia and Quebec will have to either side with the New or America. There will be no neutrality in such a war. Either Canada, Mexico, Central America, South America, etc., will be completely taken over by the New World Order meaning that their cultural distinctiveness and national independence will be forever destroyed, or they will join as allies with the United States of America in a type of union of American republics, independent republics, yet united in a common front to defend these last bastions of freedom and liberty on earth from the onslaught of a neo-Nazi New World Order dictatorship. If we choose that side which we know is favored by Almighty God, then we will have divine protection and guidance. Remember that those satanic cults which motivated the atrocities of Nazi Germany are the very same forces which are promoting the New World Order. And if you think Nazi Germany was bad news, you can bet that this time around they will have learned from their mistakes and will be far more determined this time to succeed. So we must also learn from the mistakes of our past and be even more determined to succeed than our would-be enemies. Remember what George Washington revealed in respect to his vision of America's future. Branton, too, a six-way Canadian civil war erupts, involving, in its first stage, the Cree Indians, Quebec population and the Canadian forces. And in its second stage, the population of Quebec and Canada at three different levels, a war of French against English Canadians, a war between French Catholics and English Protestants and a war of identity. At this point please allow me to offer a number of relative comments regarding the draconian agenda on and beyond planet Earth following which we will return to the Philadelphia 3 scenario, the Jesuits, who were behind the inquisitions of Europe, during which hundreds of thousands of Christians were slaughtered, and who according to writer Edmund Paris served as advisors to the Nazi SS in their inquisition against the Jews, are another example. If I am not mistaken, then it would seem that if an organization ceased from spreading a message of spiritual regeneration for the benefit of others and rather turned to killing hundreds of thousands of European Protestants and Mesoamerican natives for the sole purpose of preserving their eco-political empire, then it would seem that this would not be an institution which is based on the teachings of Jesus, and therefore are not Christian. The Jesuits never were Christians nor even Catholics. Ignatius Loyola had a previous arrest record in Spain for subversive activities as a Gnostic and had manipulated himself into the Vatican through flattery by promising an undiscerning point of his devotion as the head of a militia that would serve to protect the interests of the popes and of the Vatican. The Jesuit infiltration of Catholicism and the Masonic infiltration of Protestantism incidentally was planned well in advance by the Bavarian cults. The Bavarian serpent cults control both Jesuitism and Masonry in spite of the apparent outward animosity between the two. 
In turn they control the Bilderberg Society, which at the core has a council or 39 initiates, or 13 black nobility, 13 Wicca Masons, and 13 Maltese Jesuits. Another example of Jesuit Masonic collaboration is the Scottish Rite of Masonry itself. As an interesting note, some contactees refer to an ancient conflict involving Arianite Greys and Syrian Nordics. The Orionites and Syrians allegedly fought for control of the ancient Egyptian ruling fraternities, and this later developed into a war between the unholy Roman Empire slash Jesuit slash Nazis who were backed by the Orionites, and their opposition within the British Empire and its Masonic lodges who were backed by the Syrians. With the Orionite infiltration of the extraplanetary Ashtar Collective or the Melchizedek Lodges, and with the infiltration of the Masonic Lodges on Earth by the Orion-backed Bavarian Jesuit slash Illuminati slash Thul societies, the unsuspecting Ashtarians and Masons were manipulated into serving the agendas of the Orionite and Jesuit infiltrators, respectively. This is why humans from Sirius B who had formerly been at war with the Orionites could be turned to serving the agendas of Orionite agents, operating in and around the hale Bop Comet, who had infiltrated the Syrians' Ashtar Collective. To these Syrians, they weren't dealing with Draconian Arianites, but with Ascended Masters. hale Bop is apparently an Arianite Trojan horse, intent on supporting a new world order to be ruled in part from the Club of Rome's joint Illuminati Grey Alien Base under Pine Gap, Australia. All of this has been prepared in advance through the joint Nazi Grey abduction and implantation of millions of people throughout the world. See the quote at the beginning of this file. Am I insane? Is all of this merely the ramblings of a lunatic? I suppose time will tell, however this is what my otherworldly sources have told me, and is followed up by what others have been saying. Think about it, if a hostile alien force set its sights on Earth, would they arrive as part of a mindlessly destructive Independence Day invasion, or could we credit them with a bit more intelligence, although no less malevolence, by carrying out a type of Operation Trojan Horse? to coin a phrase from well-known ufologist John Keel. Perhaps they would plan well in advance to bring the planet to a state where resistance would be minimal. Massive abductions, mind control, infiltration, underground staging bases, genetic projects to create alien warriors who could operate well in the environment, over tourist to foolish and greedy planetary rulers so as to gain their cooperation, multi-level deception and psychological warfare, a global government that would facilitate an easier takeover taking control of the leaders of an already existing power structure rather than destroying the old structure and creating a new one. And perhaps a main invasion force arriving in the tail of a comet so as not to attract too much fear and negative reaction, and when the so-called comet passes the planet they could attempt to send out powerful transmissions to activate implants and subliminal programming within abductees. I believe that it's time that the battle lines are drawn. If we do not know who our friends and our enemies are out there, that is, those creative and free power structures as opposed to those destructive and slave power structures existing upon, below and beyond this planet, then we are more likely to become the enemy by default. The collectivist Ishtarian and Masonic lodges, with their all-inclusive philosophies, tend to cloud the line between self-centered elitist agendas as opposed to agendas based on service towards the overall good of others. The only real thing that the collectivists are unified in is their self-centeredness and in the collectives only those selves which are strongest will survive, and these selves in turn will tend to siphon the individuality from the weaker selves around them. It's like the black hole which many astrophysicists believe exists at the center of the galaxy. It is the largest black hole in the galaxy, and even though other smaller black holes exist around it, these tend to be pulled into and assimilated by the super black hole. I wonder if this has anything to do with the Nazi occult worship of the black sun, which is in essence the worship of the black hole at the center of the galaxy? The collectivists would also attempt to spread the Gnostic lie that there is no good nor evil, but just experience. From my perspective, evil is a service to self mode and good is a service to others mode, so since these two modes obviously exist, the occult Chanelers, for instance who spout this sort of rot are proven to be liars. This lie that there is no battle line, so to speak, between good and evil because neither really exists, only serves the agenda of evil. So then, we must draw the galactic battle lines between those alliances which strive to adhere to a service to others slash non-interventionist philosophy and those alliances which choose to adhere to a service to self slash interventionist philosophy. Also we will include the collectivists who claim that they don't take sides but are neutral. I am sorry, 
but in this cosmic conflict which our galaxy finds itself in there is no neutrality. It's like Switzerland, they were neutral in World War II. But of course their neutrality did not prevent them from protecting stolen Nazi gold in their bank vaults. If one is not for the side of service to others, then they are by default on the side of service to self, which leads to collectivism, since in a self-centered collective the most selfish tend to assimilate the weaker of their own kind. Collectivism is therefore a form of interventionism, since it violates and invades the individuality and personal sovereignty of others, whether on a planetary, national, local, or individual basis. Individual collectivism can be useful, like the Internet for instance because the individual has control over their interaction with the collective and can log on and log off at any time they chose. When a collective however invades a person's individuality, as the Ashtar and Grey collectives do by implanting permanent microelectronic devices within the person, invading their personal boundaries, then that collective is a dictatorship of the worst form as it violates the God-given sovereignty of those who are assimilated or born into such a collective. Once the collective has violated one's personal boundaries by one's personal choice, then they are in essence selling their soul to the collective, in this case their soul being their identity, emotions, sovereignty, free agency, etc. This puts the person's soul at extreme risk. For instance, an impending example of this on this planet would be a computer chip implanted into one's right hand or in their forehead in order to be a part of a planetary economic collective, as prophesied in Revelation chapter 13. If one succumbs to such a temptation they would in essence be giving up their soul and identity in exchange for physical gains. Once the soul is completely assimilated into such a collective there is no turning back because personal will and free choice have been forfeited. The exception would be someone who is assimilated against their will via deception, or through force and ignorances with a child. Even though I myself have been implanted with sonic mind control devices, and at least one hemisphere of my mind assimilated into the Ashtar collective. This was done without my full conscious agreement but through deception and trickery. Because of this, I have retained a conscious identity and a will which has been able by the grace of God to fight back, even though the psychic battles have been very difficult at times, a virtual psychological hell. Based on what has been learned from a number of contactees, it would seem as if the reptiloid gray interventionist collectivists have succeeded in conquering several human colonial worlds in the past through Trojan horse type strategies. Most of these have been quasi-collectivist societies whose global leaders have discouraged national, cultural and individual distinction, and who have sold themselves over to the alien agenda for self-centered motives, succumbing to the deception and propaganda of the aliens. Once the reptiloid gray collectivists however set their sights on planet Earth, they were faced with a whole new challenge. Because of planet Earth's national, cultural and individual diversity and because the situation on Earth was unpredictable as a result of this, the alien s were forced to gain more of a following of collaborating human elite than they normally would in order to establish their global dictatorship. This global New World Order government would more easily facilitate the planet's assimilation into the alien collective. In anticipation of this, the aliens began to support and infiltrate the international fraternal networks, the Lodge, or Masonry, several centuries ago. Being that the United States of America was the strongest supporter of individual sovereignty and freedom, individual distinctiveness, freedom and creativity being the mortal enemy of the collective, they established several Trojan horse underground bases in America behind the guise of technology transfer, below various strategic areas. Even though representatives from several Federation worlds, who were well aware of the nature and strategies of the reptiloid gray collectivists because of ages old conflicts with the same, warned the NSA controlled executive branch of government against having anything to do with the greys who were entering the system and staging bases that had been constructed within engineered planetoids the NSA ignored their overtures the NSA which may have already maintained a secret alliance with the reptilian collectivists due to its Nazi roots continued with the interaction projects heedless to the warnings of the federationists the technology exchanges occurred However needless to say the super technology could only be used and operated by the aliens themselves, or by agents or scientists working for the fascist corporate industrialists rather than the congressional electorate government who were completely programmed and mind controlled by the alien hive. Those within the collaboration who showed signs of resistance against the agenda had a tendency to disappear or die prematurely. The reptiloid and gray interventionists managed to infiltrate and take control of the deeper subterranean human collectivist Ashtarian colonies, 
although as they continued the planetary takeover from the bottom up, the same strategy they used to take over the minds of human abductees, from the deeper collective unconscious level to the outer individual conscious levels. They met with some resistance from more individualistic American military forces who had access to the underground network, as well as from non-collectivist federation forces. Through selective implantation and assassination, further dubious treaties, technology exchanges and false flag strategies, that is feigning benevolence, the resistance was for the most part subdued. Several Trojan horse bases that were used to gain control over specialized fields of military industrial research and development under the guise of the technology exchanges were established beneath the following areas, Montauk, Camp Hero, Long Island, Quantum Hyperspace Mechanics and Microwave Mind Control, Denver International Airport, Transportation and Human Containment, Little Cottonwood Canyon, Dougway, Utah, Cloning and Cybernetics, Mercury, Area 51, Nevada, Nuclear and Antigravity. Lancaster, Tehachapi, California, Aerospace and Computing. Fort Lewis, Madigan, Washington State, Biomedical and Bioreplication. And of course the major base which supervises the activities taking place in all of the above, the ancient underground facilities below the Dulce minus four corners area of New Mexico. It was inevitable that draconian collectivism and human individualism would eventually clash within the joint operational underground networks, and it seems to have began in 1975 during a demonstration by the graze of an antimatter reactor within the underground levels of the area. There were a large number of human scientists and security personnel present in the underground chamber where the demonstration was taking place. The greys demanded that the military officers either disarm themselves or leave the room. One military officer, offended by this display of alien arrogance on the planet where the aliens were supposed to be visitors, questioned the order. This led to a conflict of interest which erupted into a military altercation, which ended with the death of one gray alien and several dozen human scientists and security officers. Although there were apparently no further confrontations at that base at that time, the incident was not forgotten, and may have sowed the seeds of a resistance movement which escalated within the Dulce pronounced Dulce base four years later in 1979, which became known as the Dulce Wars. The resistance was led by the late Thomas Edwin Costello, who was in contact with personal friends until the mid-1990s at which point he disappeared. Costello was head of security at the multi-level base, and joined with nine other workers initially in an effort to sabotage the biomedical atrocities that were being perpetrated on abductees who were being brought to the base. Some temporarily, but others permanently. Others joined the resistance, and even a few tall repuloids which did not agree with the policies of their collective and who had developed a degree of individual emotionalism as a result of their close association with the humans, also joined. There were apparently traitors in the midst of this resistance, although just who it was is uncertain. The resistance grew as the result of the discovery that the White Draco leaders of the base had broken the treaty and were holding several thousand abductees against their will in more remote alien-controlled levels of the underground network, in cages or in cryogenic containment, so that their body parts could be used for various biogenetic experiments, or worse. Several of the scientists who had discovered the grab deception were found out and taken captive and held in peripheral sub-bases such as those beneath the Ute Reservation of SW Colorado and SE Utah, and at least two major altercations broke out. In one conflict, several special forces were sent in to rescue the captive scientists and abductees. This mission was a miserable failure, except for the fact that over 200 aliens were killed and some 66 special forces out of 100 that were sent in also died in the firefight. Another attack was apparently ordered by the leaders of the fascist collaboration, who ordered the assassination of all members of the resistance, Americans, Nordics, Reptiloids. Most of the members of the resistance were slaughtered in cold blood, although a few escaped, Thomas Costello being one of them. Whether or not these attacks were ordered by two different intelligence agencies, or one schizophrenic MJ-12 agency, the fact remains that these overall events led to a major split within the American intelligence community, and this may have contributed to a similar resistance that DID result in the sabotage and cessation for a few years at least of the Thal Society slash CIA NSA slash Orion Gray projects at the Montauk base six years later in 1985. The reptiloid and gray collectivist interventionists of Rayconis and Orion became desperate as the situation grew increasingly out of control. Time was running out, 
and the alien collectivists faced the danger that their centuries-old agenda to infiltrate and conquer the surface nations of planet Earth was falling apart at the seams. All efforts were directed towards the infiltration of American and global society in general, and the destruction of the United States Constitution and implementation of the New World Order via their collaborator agents on Earth. On a more personal note, for several years I have personally experienced unusual reoccurring dreams of interacting with aliens in underground basing systems. Some of these apparently had to do with certain Ashtarian slash Telosian Shastan slash Agarshan semi-collectivist colonies which have since been stressed by, if not infiltrated and taken over by, the Draconian Collectivists. At one point in 1995, a clear and distinct voice in my mind told me that I was a CIA agent. Fearing my sanity, I ignored the voice, however I was painfully reminded a few days later when I was told by a close friend, an abductee whose father worked on the Los Alamos Manhattan Project, that in more than one abduction experience I myself had come and taken her to some underground facilities below the foothills of the Western Rockies in the Salt Lake Valley of Utah, where we encountered alien beings. The beings presented themselves as being benevolent, but this might have been a facade, that is, unless I subsequently receive proof of the fact. During one of these experiences she asked me why I had security access to all of these underground facilities. According to her, I kid you not, I did not mention a thing about the voices in my head a few days earlier. I reluctantly told her during this abduction episode of hers that it was because I worked for the CIA. I do not consciously recall this particular incident, whether as a dream or whatever. I do however recall having several underground dreams wherein I saw the tall and in some cases small alien humanoids she mentioned. According to several contactees, during abductions alien beings often impose, through a form of technosis, a state of consciousness similar to that which one experiences while in the dream state, so that upon awakening the abductee is led to believe that the experience was all a dream, even though evidence often exists suggesting that something did happen during the night. In my friend's case it was strange bruises and markings on her body that were not there when she went to sleep. After hearing this confession by my other self of being a CIA agent, she became violently angry and the next morning recalled the emotions relative to the event and in turn the event itself. Both of us have also met other abductees who were experiencing double lives, a conscious life and a suppressed life in an altered state of consciousness, interacting with aliens of all types. Several of these people who happened to live in the Salt Lake Valley, spoke of being involved, in their nocturnal alternate lives as an abductee, with some kind of violent space war taking place between two groups of aliens who maintain underground bases and strongholds within the Rocky Mountains, with each side determined to root out the opposition. Some have suggested that some of the Greys want to break free from the Draconian-controlled Orion Empire, and may be training human abductees to fight their erstwhile draconian overlords in that capacity if such a revolution occurs. If this were to occur, due to the collective itself, it might be the individualist Yabrides who lead such a resistance, along with Greys who may have developed some degree of independent emotional expression due to their close contact with the more emotionally individualistic Yabrides. It would seem however that by commandeering the unconscious lives of abductees and training them to fight a war against the draconians, or in the case of collectivist greys against the Federation, the, the United States government, or what of you, the greys are doing to abductees on Earth exactly what the draconians have done to them. They have made them the unconscious puppets of their collective agenda. As they say, abuse tends to breed abusers. I would not suggest that our military come to the aid of any greys and hubrides, hubrides being hybrids born with a human soul matrix who are trying to defect from the draconian collective unless the greys slash hubrides fully submit themselves to a congressional or a joint congressional slash federation council if such can be established. The reason for this would be to ensure that all human forces and operations are fully monitored by Congress. There will no doubt be greys, the grey reptiloid hybrids for instance which will attempt to sabotage such a resistance or feign themselves as being part of the resistance, when in fact they would be working for the draconian elite. Such collectivist greys might try to gain the assistance of a human agency, excusing their former abuses with something like, we didn't have a choice, we were just following the orders of the dracos. But now we want to rebel and break away from the draconians, with your help. Even if there were an element of sincerity in the desire for individualist greys slash hubrides to break free, the collectivists themselves might use the situation to gain a stronger foothold in our society. As they have done with the treaties. 
even if some of the past treaties were implemented by Greys with semi-ethical motives, which I strongly doubt, then the collectivists themselves would step in and betray these treaties and use them as Trojan horses to establish more control within human society, which they have done. For this reason, any such resistance must be absolutely controlled and directed by Congress or a Congressional-slash-Federation Council. Any gray or even reptiloid that has just recently acquired individuality and partly severed itself from the collective hive could certainly not be trusted to make key life and death decisions involving humans, since they would no doubt retain some level of residual collective programming. Supposing one government agency makes a deal with the greys to fight their enemies the Draco. It could be that yet another government agency might be manipulated into an opposing agenda in what would amount to a galactic Malkaevelian scenario. In fact it may have already happened. Contactee Alex Collier claims to have learned from Andromedan Pleiadine non-interventionists, who have blockaded our system to prevent outside malevolent forces from taking advantage of our present planetary chaos and changes, that at least one agency has sent out a call for help to alien civilizations to come to our defense and assist us in rooting out the greys that have become entrenched in our planet. One group responded. Wouldn't you know it? It was the reptiloids from Alpha Draconis, whose forces are apparently en route to Earth according to Collier. Also, a large armada from Sirius B is reportedly on its way to the Sol system and due to arrive around 2004, and these may or may not be allies with the Draconians. Hopefully they are not. There are some reports which seem to imply that the large Sirius B armada may be arriving to defend their own bases in the Sol system and beneath planet Earth that are being stressed or attacked by the grey reptiloid interventionists with whom the Syrians have had conflicts in times past. As for the Alpha Draconians, if and when they are allowed into our system slash planet, they will not do anything about the greys, simply because the Draconians sent them here in the first place. My only suggestion is to declare our planet, or at least the upper and lower continental United States, a vermin-free zone, that is, no greys, no reptiloids, no insectoids, period. In order to enforce this we must demand access to the interplanetary and subterranean technology now possessed by the largely alien infiltrated military industrial complex. Those members of the Masonic MIC fraternity must realize that this is their only solution, otherwise they will remain stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place. With the threat of total assimilation, along with the individuality killing New World Order, into the alien collective on the one hand, and the threat of an invasion of their military industrial underground by angry patriotic Americans on the other hand. Returning to the incident involving my alternate identity, the day following this abduction incident, wherein my alter ego spook, or programmed sleeper agent, you might say, came and took my friend to an underground base, she noticed a black automobile with what looked like government agents sitting in it, parked across the street from her house, and she had the definite feeling that they were observing her. What I found interesting is that my friend informed me that in her experience I was left-handed or right-brain dominant, the right brain being responsible for nonverbal mental functions, whereas in my conscious life I am right-handed, left-brain dominant, the left brain being responsible for verbal mental functions. Having heard previously that those possessing an alternate personality often harbor the alternate identity in a hemisphere opposite from the one in which they are consciously dominant, I put two and two together. I have a strong impression that this alternate identity is not entirely an individual personality, but more of an implanted receptor for an alien collective mind, you might say. I've heard of abductees who have been taken aboard ships within the Ashtar Collective. They tell of being cynically linked to a powerful intelligence outside of themselves, and as a result of this they are able to perform activities that they normally would or could not do. Fly a starship for instance or rather it would be a case of the central mind flying the ship through them. Contactee Israel Norkin states that the core of the Ashtar collective operations is a 20-mile-long space-based computer mainframe, a massive artificial intelligence. I have often wondered just when and where this alternate identity was induced into my subconscious mind, apparently by the CIA alien collaboration, yet that has continued to elude me. However all of this has served to convince me of just how far the infiltration of our society has progressed and how it has affected me on a personal basis. I know of several abductees whose alternate lives with aliens has virtually drained their normal waking lives in a devastating manner, leaving many of them mental and emotional wrecks, which in turn severely affects their abilities to maintain a productive career or social life. If this has been true in my own life, and the lives of other abductees who I know, 
then how many more people have had their lives sabotaged in this manner by alien infiltration of the subconscious levels of their existence? As an example, my friend who I have mentioned above had a photographic memory when she was a teenager. However after the abductions began, she has had nothing but memory problems galore. I sometimes wonder if these aliens fascists are deliberately sabotaging our abilities as human beings in order to keep us operating at minimal potential, and facilitate continued control over us on an individual, national and global basis. With the understanding that I am not the only one who has been a victim of this type of intervention, you can perhaps understand my zeal in getting this information out to as wide an audience as possible and above all to those suffering abductees whom a skeptical society has ignored and ridiculed. Just remember, in spite of those who do not understand, not having undergone the overall abuses that we have, for which they should be eternally thankful, there are millions of people in America and around the world who do understand. I do hope and pray that the information within this file will help you to break free from the influence of the intruders and reclaim your personal sovereignty. Remember. You have the power to claim your independence from these collectivist parasites. Their weapon is to deceive you into believing that you must submit and that you have no choice in the matter. This is a lie. Once the enemy within was exposed however, and I began to resist the process of alien infiltration of my unconscious mind, I was in a sense able to defect from the collective with some rather damaging information, damaging to the continuity of the collective, that is. The collectivists are taking a chance by connecting individualist humans to their collective via synic implants, as there is always the possibility that the implants might work both ways. That is, if the abductee becomes aware of how he or she is being manipulated and controlled on an unconscious level, then that person's individual nature may out of self-preservation feel that his or her personal sovereignty is being threatened and they might try to take back control. In so doing, they might succeed in probing or interrogating the collective violating its innermost secrets and thereby threatening its security. This is why the aliens are depending so much on mind control and memory repression via technosis and electrochemical dissolution of memory, and whatever other methods they use to impose mind control. I will say for a fact that if I can fight back, then other abductees who have been implanted or even those who have been born into the Ashtar collective below or beyond this planet can also fight back and reclaim their individual identities and independence especially with the help of divine intervention. Since my personal discovery of the Ashtari and Draconian conspiracy to assimilate the people of this planet, I have found some remarkable similarities between my perceived reality and certain aspects of the science fiction media. It would seem that the collective unconscious of humanity here on Earth perceives certain things on a more subtle level that emerge in the form of inspiration at the conscious level, for instance the possibility of being assimilated into an alien control network. And yes, Star Trek was right on, at least in regards to this part of alien reality, although a scientifically sophisticated race would use micro-miniaturized mind control devices integrated into the brain's central nervous system rather than the slow and bulky cybernetic devices depicted in the series and movies. I had to laugh at the movie Mars Attacks, because there was so much truth in it in regards to how certain leaders and grey-hugging abductees have dealt with the aliens. The apparent need for people to worship the super technology of the greys in spite of their abuses against our society, is incredible. In some cases, as with certain mind-controlled Stockholm Syndrome secret government agents themselves, it comes down to just plain fear of the power of these creatures. In other words they love them because they are afraid not to. We can liken this to the early serpent cults, such as the ancient Neolithic cults which existed on the island of Malta, who built intricate underground temples. For instance the hypogeum of House of Lini, which some actually believe connects at the lowest levels to a massive alien underground system, in which they sacrificed tens of thousands of humans in ancient times in order to appease the serpentine gods of the underworld. Incidentally, in the late 1930s over 30 school children disappeared without a trace within the hypogeum of House of Lini catacombs of Malta along with their teachers and guides, an incident which was reported in National Geographic magazine for August. 1940. On a more human level there was the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, who in essence turned Czechoslovakia over to Adolf Hitler in a pitiful attempt to appease this dictator's appetite for conquest. It had the opposite effect however, and only served to increase Adolf Hitler's appetite and boldness for conquest and his disdain for weak-willed leaders like Chamberlain. It would be wise to learn from the mistakes of the past. Then there are the legends, whether they have any basis in fact or not of the dragons and dragon slayers of old. For instance there was the leader of the city of Salini, Libya whose community, according to legend, 
was plagued by a fire-breathing dragon. He attempted to appease the beast with livestock, until the livestock were all depleted and the villagers began casting lots so that the chosen ones could be sacrificed and the city could be spared temporarily from further devastating attacks from the dragon. One day the king's own daughter was chosen, and although grief-stricken the king nevertheless allowed her to be tied to the post outside the city. As the dragon approached, a knight on a white horse and clad in silver armor approached from another direction. It was the notorious Christian dragon slayer Saint George. With his steel lance and a shield with a red cross emblazoned on a white background reflecting the bright sunlight, the knight swiftly approached the dragon and impaled it through. Legend says that St. George married the Princess of Cellini and they lived happily ever after, as could be expected for a traditional storybook ending. Even if the legend is more symbolic than fact, it nevertheless holds many truths that may be learned today in our dealings with certain alien and or totalitarian agendas. In short, appeasement is never the answer. It is merely a form of capitulation or surrender. The Ashtarian collectivists below and beyond this planet for instance believed that by appeasing their enemies and allowing them access to their societies, that these malevolent entities might be converted to the side of reason. This may have been successful in a few instances, however there are those forces who are so degenerate, like spiritual black holes that have lost every vestige of light within themselves, that they will never turn from the side of evil. And so, Throwing one's pearls before such swine will merely increase their appetite for more pearls, and their disdain for those who cast them. In respect to the reptiloids and greys, I would personally offer my interpretation of the prophecy in Genesis 3.14, which from my perspective would indicate that the reptiloids have become a reprobate race with no hope of attaining any degree of spiritual integrity, having completely annihilated as a race any degree of spiritual virtues which they might have originally possessed. History has proven over and over and over again that the reptiloids slash greys are, in spite of their vast collective intellect, creatures that are irreparably turned over to base predatory animal instinct, and have lost all sense of individual conscience. Having in essence become the absolute slaves of those astral parasites, if you will, who control them. A physical form capable of developing advanced technology yet not capable of maintaining any degree of self-motivated spiritual maturity or conscience to tame such lower predatory instincts should not be tolerated in this universe. They should not be tolerated any more than an AIDS virus, which knows nothing other than conquest and destruction, should be tolerated within a human body. These reptiloids should pay for what they have done to our people as well as to millions if not billions of men, women and children and other colonial worlds throughout the galaxy. I cannot stress this conviction too much. Of course I am referring here only to bipedal reptilian entities capable of developing technology, and not to the many genetic hybrids who have been born with a human soul matrix, nor to non-bipedal reptiles. Also, any bipedal reptilian that is severed from the collective and has been tamed so to speak should not be included in this extermination, however it should be forbidden from procreating after its kind. Genesis 3.14 states that this is the decision of the Almighty, and after all IT is his universe, which was decreed for the sake of the rest of humankind and the creation. Otherwise, if the problem were allowed to continue, the insatiable predatory drives of these unnatural creatures of unbounded appetite and evil will eventually cause their corrupting influence to spread throughout the whole galaxy and universe, and this would eventually mean the end of all human life as we know it. Since the reptiloids and reptilian greys have never shown any interest, as an interventionist collective, in respecting human life anywhere in the universe. Nor have they shown any interest in making peace with humankind, except in the case of false overtures of feigned peace which always, but always has resulted in the inevitable betrayal and destruction of the human society with whom they have established a peace treaty. The Genesis prophecy was not necessarily fulfilled at the time it was spoken. As it is with numerous prophecies, this one would not be completed until a later time. Isaiah 65 25 states that the completion of this prophecy will occur sometime during the millennium. All of the above was confirmed by Dr. Paul Benuitz, who was one of the most notorious and original investigators of the gray alien presence operating within the base underneath the Arcoleta Mesa near Dulce, and also the canyons near Los Alamos, New Mexico. Benuitz was later committed to an Albuquerque mental hospital with the help of William Moore and other CIA-backed ufologists who emphatically denied that the abductions cattle mutilations, and underground bases existed. It is interesting that part of the alleged deal between the CIA and the alien greys was that in exchange for technology the CIA had to cover up the reality of the abductions, cattle mutilations, 
and the underground bases. While in the mental hospital, Benuitz was electroshocked into submission, and when released he publicly stated that he had no more interest in UFOs. Before this however, Benuitz had stated that, from his own experiences with the alien, he used the word in a collective sense because most of the aliens there are like individual cells in a vast controlling collective organism. He came to the firm conviction that the alien was irreparably deceitful and that the only way that the aliens slash aliens could be dealt with or reasoned with is to deal with them as one would with a mad dog. The alien collective, being completely sold over to their base animal instincts and to the will of the Luciferian controllers of the collective, only respect one form of authority. That is, brute force. In light of the Luciferian connection, I would say brute spiritual force as well. If as some claim the true behind the scenes controllers of the Draconian Collective or Hive are the rebel angels themselves, then aside from technological and psychological attack they would use sorcery or black witchcraft to attack our spiritual nature. If these rebel angels are irreparably committed to evil, then their puppets, who we know as the Grace or Reptiloids, may be about as repentant as these infernal beings are themselves. Unless of course the greys slash reptiloids are somehow able to break free from the grasp of the Luciferian collective. As I stated earlier, it is important for us to know where the battle lines exist in this immediate sector of the galaxy surrounding our own solar system, which naturally is the sector where the most ancient of all the galactic cultures exist. Planet Earth of course being by far the oldest of all worlds in this sector. I should state that some of the other planetary cultures claim to travel interdimensionally and have spoken to their contactees of eleven densities and a twelfth that is now spontaneously manifesting within the omniverse. The omniverse itself would consist of our matter universe as well as its antimatter twin or Dal counterpart universe, and also the twelve densities which make up the omniverse, including our own single quote third density reality. In some of these densities, time reportedly flows at different rates. In some of these dimensions three days on another dimensional world would be equivalent to three hours on third dimensional earth. In other words a culture on planet earth may have been established at the same time as one established within another realm by ancient astronaut fraternities for instance, yet one civilization would be older than the other. These ancient astronaut colonies were allegedly composed of the most advanced minds of the ancient world earth or people who were initiated into those secret scientific lodges whose agents continually searched out those whose intelligence rose high above the average. The motives of some of these scientific fraternities may have been honorable, that is keeping dangerous knowledge out of the hands of the warring masses to prevent their self-destruction. The motives of others were not so honorable, and boiled down to nothing less than intellectual or fraternal snobbery and elitism. These ancient brain drains would have kept the general population of Earth in a state of constant technological atrophy whereas the scientific fraternities would go on to develop their sciences by pooling their knowledge and resources, commencing to colonize other realms below, beyond, or even parallel to planet Earth, by face shifting into other densities through Philadelphia Montauk type technology, let's say for instance into a dimensional density with a 3 day to 3 hour ratio as described above. Therefore using this ratio, a culture established on planet Earth in 1000 before Christ might be 3000 years old in 2000 AD, whereas a culture established in a peripheral dimensional density at the same point in time might conceivably be 78000 years old in 2000 AD, relatively speaking. The solidity of such a dimensional reality would not be as concrete as our own according to some theories, because space and time must work together. If you increase time, then space must give up some of its ground in the process, and vice versa. So objects and events in such a dimensional reality might be more fluid or dreamy than in the concrete third dimensional reality because space and matter must capitulate some of its territory over to time in the give and take manner. However all dimensions interact with each other at the more subtle levels of reality. Events in one dimension affect the outcome of events in others. In a type transdimensional cause and effect. There are some contactees who suggest that the concept of time as we know it is flawed. In other words the future would not necessarily be in front of us and the past behind us, but the eternal now would exist in the same space yet in different phases or frequencies. One symbolic representation might be to say that time is rather a woven conglomeration of events. These events can be seen symbolically as water in its various phases. That is. The so-called future might be seen in general as events that are in a gaseous state. These events have substance but they are not concrete or set. The so-called present could be seen as liquid. 
present events are more solid than gaseous events, yet are still fluid enough to be manipulated, channeled and formed by divine or human will. The so-called past would generally be those events that have become set or solid, like ice. They are set and cannot be undone. Now there may be some events before us that are solid, and some events behind us that are gaseous you could say, and the present or the eternal now could, like water, intersect any point within the event chain where gaseous events have yet to phase into solid events. So it would not so much be past behind and future ahead as it would be a case of cause and effect events that are in a transitional state from a gaseous phase to a liquid phase to a solid phase. If time travel were possible, and one were to go into the past and try to change a concrete event, some believe that this will result in what is called a paradox, or two solid events occupying the same space. Now since two solids cannot occupy the same third dimensional space, the new event which would be challenging an already existent set event in the same time space could not possibly retain its solidity or remain in that same space. So in essence a paradox cannot exist within the concrete third density. If this time traveler were to insist on changing a set event and remained in the past or in that part of the event chain to see what would happen if they broke the chain, according to some of those involved with the Amman Tauk projects for instance, he or she would simply create a localized quantum field and this field and its occupants would simply be shoved off to the side and out of the third density and into a peripheral dimension where paradoxes can exist due to the fluid slash dreamy slash surreal nature of objects and events and that reality. He or she would in essence phase out into a gaseous thought form state along with all others who may have happened to be phased out of the third dimension in this manner. This is apparently nature's simple way of dealing with paradoxes. The more one tampers with time, in essence being removed from the event chain, the less grounding they will have in space matter. We might conceive that one can tamper with time and create so many paradoxes that they are shifted into a density with almost no concrete matter at all. At this point they would as has been suggested, exist as little more than the materialized thought forms, which in my book would probably not be a very exciting existence. So don't be too quick to give in to certain channeled entities who would like for us to give up our ground or our hold in the third dimension, or material reality, and become involved in a collective new age ascension into the fourth and fifth dimensions. It may be that they don't want us inhabiting the third dimension simply because doing so gives us a great deal of influence over the other dimensions. Third dimensional matter or material is not evil as certain Gnostic cults believe. Matter is merely a tool. It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. So although we should be vigilant in defending our planet, I believe that we should also be vigilant in defending our dimension as well. So then, at this point I will detail what I perceive to be the interstellar borders in this sector of the galaxy, based on what I've learned from my own cosmic experiences and sources as well as through many other confirmations. The following is based on years of research and interaction with abductees and contactees and by reviewing elusive but dramatic consistencies within thousands of books, documents, files, etc. Essentially these borders, as I perceive them, are as follows. The Andropleidine Federation, the non-interventionists, have major alliances within the following star systems, take it a Pleiades. Vega Lyra. Iama slash Ama slash Wolf 424. Tau Ceti. Epsilon Ardani. Persian. Alpha Centauri, etc. The Draco Orion Empire, the interventionists, abductors slash mutilators, etc. are dominant in Alpha Draconis, Epsilon Boots, Zeta II Reticuli, Rigel Orion, Bellatrix Orion, Polaris, Nemesis, etc. Nemesis by the way is a dark star or a protostar outside of the Sol system in the direction of Orion, yet nearer than Proxima Centauri, which was not massive enough to attain stellar fusion. Instead it condensed into a huge solid frozen sphere that has been detected by our IRA satellites. Nemesis is reportedly the major staging center for Draconian, Orion operations against the Sol system and has been the source of many of the engineered planetoids. Like Geographos and Asterisk Phobos, Asterisk Wereside 2000, original greys which serve as the biogenetic sources for the millions of great loans operating in the Sol system. Phobos is also where the 109 members of the original human personnel exchange program really ended up, according to contact Alex Collier, where they were used as fodder for further biogenetic experimentation, and also other planetoids which have cruised through the Sol system since at least 1953. Many of these planetoids have made unpredictable course alterations, 
and in 1953 two of them simultaneously established stable geosynchronous orbits around planet Earth, strongly suggesting that they are being controlled. These have apparently served as staging bases for the gray-slash-reptiloid collectivists in their abduction, mind control, implantation, genetic, animal mutilation, underground base, and infiltration projects on Earth. As confirmation of the above, the Melbourne Sun, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, August 25, 1954 issue, carried an article titled, The New Satellites, which stated, two meteors, asteroids, had become satellites of the Earth and were revolving with IT 400 to 600 miles out in space, the latest issue of the American magazine Aviation Week said yesterday. The magazine said that the discovery of the satellites threw the Air Force into confusion this summer. Alarm over the sightings ended only after they had been identified as natural rather than man-made. Another possibility may be that they were both engineered natural objects such as hollowed-out planetoids. The simultaneous arrival of two large asteroids, not meteors, combined with the fact that both took up a geosynchronous orbit synchronized with the revolving of the Earth and positioned always over a particular geographical location, would be an incredible coincidence indeed. According to inside sources, the NSA established radio contact with the Greys operating within these planetoids and this led to the 1954 Edwards slash Morox slash Holloman F. Blandings and Eisenhower administration with the space-based Greys and Reptiloids, even though previous treaties, Truman, etc., were signed with the humanoid Telos slash Ashtar slash Agarty slash Melchizedek groups under Mount Shasta, California and the reptiloid Great Reconis Bootsarianite connected groups under Mount Arculeta, near Dulce, New Mexico. According to former Dulce base security officer Thomas Costello, the Shasta Treaty dates back to the Grover Cleveland Presidency. This would also include the Agarty and Silver Fleet Ashtar forces below Central Asia and the Posidine colonies below the Mato Grosso and surrounding regions of the Brazilian underground. It was apparently Truman who later established or updated the treaty with the subterranean, Arculeta. Grays just after World War II, in addition to the already existent treaty with the Greys that the Bavarian government had established via the Gazette Phoenix Empire as early as 1933. In addition to the Andropleiadine Federation and the Draco Orion Empire, the third major interstellar alliance within this sector of the galaxy is believed to be the Corporate Collective, also known as the Ashtar or Astart Collective which has ties with the ancient humanoid reptiloid collaborations of Egypt, India and Babylon. This alliance has major centers of influencing Altair Aquila, Sirius B, Arcturus, Aldebaran, Zeta Ireticuli, Boot Centaurus, and of course Sol, etc. The collectivists, who consist of various humanoid, reptiloid, insectoid, etc. races, may be either interventionists or non-interventionists depending on which side they are allying themselves with at any given time. The Andropleodine non-interventionists or the Draco Arianite interventionists. So much for my perceptions of the geopolitical workings of the immediate sector of the universe, based on what I've learned from various galactic intelligence sources. Let us now return to the Sol system and continue with what has been learned from more down-to-earth intelligence and research sources. Let us focus for a moment on the subject of the Jesuit Masonic collaboration. It was a collaborative cult of Jesuits and Masons, in the form of the Knights of the Golden Circle who at the behest of the black nobility infiltrated both the northern and southern governments during the American Civil War. The black nobility were fearful that a strong and independent America would threaten the economic domination of the world which the European elite held. Their agents in the north and the south drove a wedge between the Yanks and rebels and helped to foment and precipitate the war. Just as there was a legitimate argument in the Vietnam War, communism. There was also a legitimate argument in the Civil War slavery in a country where all men were supposed to be equals. However these outward tensions were being aggravated and manipulated by the New World Order agents behind the scenes. Before returning to the Philadelphia Three Revelations, I'd like to share just one more source of information in relation to the above. The following information is taken from the book, Tribulation 99, Alien Anomalies Under America, subtitle, The Shocking Truth About the Coming Apocalypse, by retired Air Force Colonel Craig Baldwin. Baldwin has been tracking the Quetzal conspiracy for well over a decade. Despite the risk to his personal safety, Baldwin continues to make public his astonishing findings through screenings and lecture tours worldwide. 1991, Ediciones La Calavera. P.O. Box 1106. Peter Stuyvesant Station. New York, 
New York 10009-1106. The following is a paraphrase of some of the highlights of Baldwin's research. Dash, dash, the Quetzal conspiracy involves an alien species of reptilian hominoids that have been collaborating since ancient times with a renegade branch of degenerate Mayan cultists. In more recent times the Nazis have apparently joined forces with this unholy alliance and are working with them to undermine South and North America. Dash, dash, one of the servants of the Quetzal conspiracy was the National Socialist President of Guatemala beginning 1951, Jacobo Arbenz, who was actually, according to Baldwin, an infiltrator from the Quetzal Collective. He plotted the takeover of the United Fruit Company, and confiscated large tracts of land throughout Guatemala. It is said that members of his secret cult, tied in with the aliens, reinstituted the ancient Mayan practice of human sacrifice. Over 40,000 Guatemalans disappeared mysteriously during his leadership. Several bodies were later found in the craters of extinct volcanoes throughout the area, as if they had been mutilated and then dropped from the air. Dash, dash the Quetzals? whose major base is in Antarctica, near the Nazis' New Berlin base. Branton, have infiltrated South and Central America via a system of caverns and tunnels, and have done the same throughout North America. One of these areas was under the Nevada desert. Nuclear tests, intentionally, shattered some of their major underground facilities, and the Quetzals vowed retaliation. Dash dash though the United States government sent 20,000 M16 assault rifles to the Guatemalan army. According to Baldwin this was to fight continued Quetzal infiltration and activity in and under that country. Over Guatemalan 100,000 soldiers reportedly died in conflicts with the inter-terrestrial forces. Dash dash Antarctica and its vortex area is the major headquarters from where the Quetzals slash Nazis or reptilians slash fascists plan a planetary takeover from the bottom up. The Quetzals are named after the Mayan serpent god Quetzalcoatl. Dash dash alien programming is being broadcast on the 666 megahertz frequency, the same wavelength as human thought, throughout the, the United States and the world. Dash dash at least six space shots, satellites, as well as the Challenger space shuttle itself were destroyed by Quetzal-backed Illuminati. Occult forces in an attempt to sabotage America's overt space program. A particle beam weapon used by this fifth column in collaboration with an alien base near Port Salinas may have been used to destroy our space vessels. Dash dash the Quetzal, Joint Rebellion, Renegade Mayan, and Nazi forces have attempted to take over Central American governments via infiltration, Nicaragua, Granada, Chile, Guatemala, El Salvador, Panama. They have undermined these areas through a system of artificial tunnels and natural caverns which they control. Chilean President Salvador Allende was also implicated in the conspiracy. Baldwin also discusses scalar wave earthquake generators that were focused on the fault lines of Chile and tuned to their frequency to produce instability, resulting in massive earthquakes. These scalar waves were detected by ITT, which controls Chile's communications network. Dash dash Henry, Operation Paperclip, Kissinger placed his ex. Nazi friend Walter Ralph into the leadership of Chilean intelligence after Allende's fall. Klaus Barbie was still alive in Bolivia at the time. Allende's former ambassador to the United States dies while driving down Embassy Row on September 21, 1976, when he mysteriously bursts into flames. So then, bringing the conspiracy back to the human collaborator level of this cosmic conspiracy, we now return to the Philadelphia 3 agenda. The planned civil war by the elite of the New World Order has also been related for a time in well-analyzed and proved prophecy documents in recent Canadian history. 3. The Cree Indians unwilling to remain in an independent Quebec, rise up in the Ugada Rebellion, appeal to the Canadian government to honor Crown treaties with the Cree, and attempt to retain their lands and loyalty to Canada while the English-Canadian community of Quebec appeal to the federal government to protect them against the rise up of political tenseness and violent acts they are victims of. 4. As an act of desperate political pressure, the Cree Indians then seize the massive James Bay hydro-generating facilities located in northern Quebec, and sabotage them causing immediate massive power outages in Quebec which ripple through the grid, down all southeastern industrial areas of Ontario and also the entire east and northeastern coast of the United States. Nineteen American states, including the District of Columbia, will be directly affected by the massive blackout, which will follow the sabotage of the James Bay hydro-generating facilities in northern Quebec. These states are Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, New Jersey, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, North and South Carolina, 
Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio and the District of Columbia, paralyzing all activities in Washington. Within the first hours of this massive blackout the President will trigger and implement over a dozen executive orders including EO 11490 which will install martial law and suspend the constitutional rights into the targeted states. Note, if and when this happens, ignore these so-called executive orders. If they are unconstitutional then they are illegal and are not worth the paper they are written on. Nevertheless, be careful because at this point the New World Order will have outwardly declared war on the Constitutional Republic of the United States of America, if they have not already done so just by establishing such so-called executive orders, Branton, FEMA, UN Battle Groups, Fenson, MJTF and BATF would then go into action, firearms would be confiscated while all constitutional rights and guarantee would be suspended. Note, can't you just see it? The UN Gestapo units break into the homes of your typical Joe Redneck American, who says, You want my gun, eh? Okay here. Have my lead too. Blame. As far as I'm concerned, these invaders should be treated just like any thief that might break into a home. After all if you're a patriot, you'll probably end up in one of their death camps anyway if they arrest you, according to their current agenda. The owner and potential victim in such an attack would be justified in defending their home with deadly force. Maybe when the gun grabbers start dying off right and left, then the New World Order will justify an outside invasion of American soil in order to restore order in America as part of a UN military action. It doesn't matter how many gun grabbing pawns or occupying forces are killed in the process, what is important is that the black nobility elite get their New World Order. To hell with the pawns, the so-called elite would say, they are merely a means to an end. If only the communist forces involved in the UN operations knew that their true leaders are what they despise the most, that is, corporate imperialists or international bankers with fraternal roots in Bavaria who have bought out these UN member countries as a result of long and carefully planned agendas involving massive loans to these same countries. Fully aware that these loans would be hoarded and misused by the greedy leaders of these countries and that as a result these loans could never be repaid in full. The banksters in turn demanded access to various national resources or military forces within these debtor countries as reimbursement, and the sovereignty of these nations have slowly been assimilated into the global UN slash new power structure. If there was one major mistake that the founding fathers made, and no doubt it was because many of them were wealthy businessmen, it was their failure to place in the, the United States Constitution sufficient safeguards to prevent the electorate government from being subverted by corporate imperialists. The problem has been with the media, and the international banking forces which control the media. Another problem was in giving too much power to one man, the President of the United States. History has proven that the media has a major influence on forming public opinion, if not engaging in all-out propaganda and mind control. The international banking interests controlling the media have the power to build up candidates of their own choosing and tear down those who they do not like. Once their hireling is in office they, incredibly, have the power to appoint their own unelected executive staff. Not only this, but they have the power to enact executive orders, to sign over the economic or military reserves of the nation to private and elected organization, to create secret intelligence agencies manned by unelected persons, and to veto decisions made by Congress, who should be the real governing power. Where did we go wrong? When did we cease from being a democracy and begin sliding into the sewers of a financial fraternal elitist monarchy? the kind of government that the founding fathers of the American Union detested so much? Branton. Specific troops dressed with flat black uniforms and unmarked units will be brought in by a 60 Black Hawk helicopters. They will then be deployed on line and swept though towns, building by building, block by block, and remove by force if necessary the civilians from towns. Each search team will carry three lists, a black list, a white list, and a gray list. The names on the blacklist will be removed in total from their residences in business by force, hogtied by flex cuffs, and placed on the unmarked black helicopters for removal to some unknown, pre-programmed destination. Those on the white list collaborators will be removed for their own safety and flown out, and those on the gray list will also be removed for their own safety, but the troops have been told that they should be watched because they weren't sure which list they fit on yet. So under this type of full state of emergency, Thousands of Americans guilty of hate, environmental, financial or gun control crimes or criminal violation of any of tens of thousands of new government regulations.
or resistance to the New World Order will be likely to be imprisoned. This is why George Bush moved in recent years to double the United States prison capacity. These specific troops that will remove pre-identified civilians from given areas and will confiscate firearms, subversive elements, remove certain groups for political and or religious reasons, targeted groups will be gun owners, certain religious groups, and other groups or organizations considered detrimental to the peacekeeping or peace-restoring missions of an occupying force or the objectives of the current government body. These troops will make massive use of mechanized infantry, assault units, Light Infantry Units, MPS, and they all will be connected with the Special United Nations Task Forces. These special units will consist of Rhodesians, East Germans, Bulgarians, Hungarians, Estonians, Afghans, Pakistanis, Gurkhas and South Africans, brought in from countries that, of late, had professional armies which no longer exist, or have downscaled their force structure, and have provided a surplus of military troops for the opposition and been placed under the auspices of the UN for special activated operations. Such troops will be useful for such operations because they will not have families here, and they have been secreted and sequestered aboard remote non-active military reservations to keep them away from the civilian population and from discovery. Note, just exactly how many the United States military bases have been deactivated, I do not know for certain. I have heard from one source that there are over 200 non-active United States military bases which were officially closed once the Cold War ended, and were no longer needed. I cannot state how accurate this number is nor whether this refers to bases worldwide or just in the United States. I would suspect worldwide. We should remember however that several sources claim that a large number of the, the United States military bases, whether active or inactive, possess extensive underground base counterparts. Many of the UN occupying forces are reportedly stationed in such underground facilities until they are called into action. In a sense, America has already been infiltrated and undermined, if not invaded by UN, NWO forces. Branton. They, the hidden new forces, also will not owe the local population any form of loyalty or concern. They have the mentality of occupation forces in a hostile environment. Their actual possible slash probable opposition locations are in larger facilities such as Fort Lewis, Washington. These troops are considered mercenaries or black shirts. The scenario these troops will likely use is practice to insert forces by fast rope in a vertical insertion into a confined area such as a downtown, suburban or industrial area where no adequate helicopter landing zones LZS, are available. Martial law is a system of government under the direction of military authority. It is an arbitrary kind of law, proceeding directly from military power and having no immediate constitutional or legislative sanction. It is only justified by necessity and supersedes all civil government. Martial law is built on a no-settle principle, but is arbitrary and, in truth, no law. Suspension of the writ of habeas corpus that is right to trial by judge and jury and protection from illegal imprisonment is a major element of martial law. As Justice Blackstone wrote, in this case, the nation parts with a portion of its liberty and suspected persons may then be arrested without cause assigned. In light of the above, when the FEMA, UN Gestapo forces come knocking down your door without your consent and without warrant, steal your guns, your computers and personal belongings under the pretext of a national emergency, or even attempt to relegate you and your family elsewhere in opposition to your rights as laid out in the, the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights, then this will not be an act of the law, but an act of war. You have the right to resist as laid out in the Declaration of Independence. Read these documents, because they are the foundation and lifeblood of the American Republic. In the end, the last line of defense of the American Republic, or that system of government which is laid out in the, the United States Constitution, Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, will not be those who are guilty of high treason within our government who have sold America over to the New World Order. It will be the citizens' militia, which is authorized by the Second Amendment. And for all you military, police and government officials who have sworn to uphold and defend the, the United States Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic. When and if a national emergency is declared, and when you begin receiving conflicting instructions from the elected senatorial congressional government and from the unelected military industrial government, then it will be up to you personally to determine which instructions will serve the interests of your American Republic, and which will serve the interests of their new world order.